the best thing the first Iron Man had going for it, other than that whole good director, good cast, good script thing, was that it was new, or at least as new as superhero movies are generally going to get. Fans had never seen the character rendered in live action before, and non-fans had never, well, most of them had never even heard of him. And if they had, they probably weren't intimately familiar with his origin or supporting cast or villains. It was a rare hero's journey that you could enjoy fresh without the weight of prior iterations breathing down its neck like some other guys have to deal with. And the fans? Well, if the most note-perfect costume translation since Spider-Man wasn't enough to mollify them, there was always this. Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Oh. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. All those factors, plus, you know, it was also really, really good, is why we all had a great time with Iron Man. Great enough to overlook some of the stuff that didn't exactly work. You know, like the bad guy not really being all that interesting, or the final action scene not really being as good as the ones in the middle or the beginning. After all, how bothered by that stuff can you be when Pirate Shaft shows up and tells you that the countdown to the coolest damn thing ever just began? Iron Man 2, on the other hand, doesn't get to start with any of those bonuses in its favor. Now, everyone knows who Iron Man is, and the same fans who had their critical eyes short-circuited by the word Avengers will be going over this one like the Zapruder film looking for clues. And as if living up to its lightning-in-a-bottle predecessor wasn't enough, it's also tasked with serving as the foundation of its own inevitable sequel, plus at least three other movies. That's a lot of pressure, even for a dude who wrestles fighter jets. See, movies that become surprise mega-hits are a lot like people who win the lottery. Some people will immediately move into a way bigger house because they think they're supposed to, except they don't really know what to do with a way bigger house, and they end up with half-used rooms, and stuff is falling apart, and suddenly they're actually in worse shape than they were to begin with. I'm looking at you, Matrix Reloaded. But then there's the other guy. The guy who stays in the smaller house but uses his winnings to make it better. Fix stuff up, seed the lawn, maybe build an addition or a garage. Basically take what was already good enough and hammer it out into just plain damn good. Iron Man 2 is that guy. The damn good guy. It's playing in about the same size field as the first movie, but now more comfortably. It's working with the same basic set of tools, but it knows how to use them better. The most visible example of this is the way it keeps the original film's hierarchy of elements. Relationships, universe building, and character development come first, action comes second, the immediate threat, aka bad guys, come last. That last part is probably going to be the closest thing the film has to a real problem, because it means the villains get the short shrift again, and this time they're a lot of fun. Mickey Rourke's Whiplash is a Russian mad scientist with a family grudge against Tony Stark, and Sam Rockwell's Justin Hammer is a wannabe who'd like to copy the Iron Man technology and sell it to the army. It's a nice spin on the usual supervillain sequel team-up that we know pretty much from the get-go that these guys are both trying to screw each other over, and it would have been nice to have a little more of them. But then, thus far, this series isn't really all about the bad guy, the way that the Batman movies are. The growth of the main character remains the primary focus. This time around, the battery that gives Iron Man his powers and keeps his heart going is giving him electrical poisoning, and without a cure to be found, Stark is acting erratic, taking crazy risks, and alienating his friends and hitting the bottle, which is making the government think maybe it needs to crack down on the whole robo-suit vigilante thing. In many ways, Iron Man, or at least his ego, is the real villain of his own movie, while Whiplash and Hammer are just exacerbating circumstances that make him get his act together. It's all about Tony Stark having to learn to be a team player. Speaking of teams, S.H.I.E.L.D. is sure hanging around an awful lot more in this one, dropping hints about further adventures, but also having some well-earned fun at the expense of those of us who've been combing for clues. Oh, and in case you hadn't heard, stay through the credits. Again. This ain't complicated, guys. Pretty much everything that was true about the first Iron Man is just as true about Iron Man 2. Great characters, solid action, not perfect, but plenty of room to expand and improve. Dark Knight? Not quite. But in terms of matching witty human drama with colorful superhero adventuring, it doesn't get much better than this. See you next time. Oh yeah, and if you're wondering if I forgot someone, well, folks, I'd love to tell you all the thoughts that were running through my head about Scarlett Johansson's performance in this, Except this is a family show, so... In 2001, at least four major superhero movies are hitting theaters within the span of only a few months, and out of all of them, Thor is not only the first horse out of the gate, it also represents the biggest gamble. Tasked not only with introducing mainstream audiences to one of Marvel Comics' most singularly preposterous creations, but also with introducing elements of fantasy and outright magic to Marvel's bold experiment in shared universe movie continuity en route to the genre-defying team-up feature The Avengers in 2012.
And make no mistake, Thor is not playing it safe. This is balls-out, no-compromises cosmic fantasy, an action-adventure film that frequently looks less like a comic book than it does like a unicorn-encrusted trapper keeper, and begins with the kind of crazy big premise other films might spend a whole story explaining, namely that the ancient Norse gods, as in Asgard, Acer, Rainbow Bridge, Jotunheim, Frost Giants, the whole shebang, actually did, and still do, exist. In the story proper, the time is coming for Odin, the king of the Viking gods, to retire and pass his crown to his son Thor, aka the God of Thunder, who's pretty much the chief ass-kicker of Asgard, but also kind of a pompous douchebag. When he pulls a particularly rash stunt, he winds up restarting a war between the gods and frost giants. Odin decides that Thor needs to have some humility beaten into him, so he takes away his godly powers and his signature weapon, the magic hammer Mjolnir, and busts them both down to Earth as punishment. If he wishes to be a god again, Thor will have to prove himself worthy as a human hero. This is easier said than done, as you'll recall from Iron Man 2, Mjolnir itself has been quarantined off by the shady government agency S.H.I.E.L.D., while back up on Asgard, Thor's brother Loki, the god of mischief, is using his brother's absence as the pretext for a coup of his own. On a technical level, Thor can be summed up as a triumph of execution. It doesn't have the most polished CGI in film history, and no amount of clever lighting could make the Asgardian's ridiculous sensibilities in the realms of costuming and architecture, both of them much more reminiscent of the 1980s Flash Gordon movie than anything in actual Norse mythology look like something anyone would want to wear or live in, but the design of it is so strikingly original and proudly presented it's kind of hard to care. This is the first Marvel movie to really go for broke in capturing the signature aesthetic sensibility that artist Jack Kirby brought to the original Thor comics, and the result is a blockbuster that looks utterly unlike anything you've recently seen in theaters. In a world where characters in shining armor blast across space on horseback through rainbow-colored wormholes to do battle with entire planets of towering frost giants, realism might as well be a dirty word, and Thor positively revels in its own visual absurdity, but without losing track of its narrative cohesion. Admittedly, part of that is because the narrative itself is made surprisingly simple. Eschewing the tendency toward grown-up time introspection as seen in Iron Man or The Dark Knight, Thor keeps things squarely in the broad, almost fairy tale like beats of the myths that inspired it. It's a story about a guy who was a jerk and has to learn his lesson before he can have his hammer back to fight monsters. That's it. Amusingly, despite the PG-13 rating, this makes it easily the most kid-friendly superhero movie since Spider-Man. But the main reason it works seems to be that Marvel made a crazy choice for the director, and it paid off. Kenneth Branagh, classically trained actor, highly respected star of stage and screen, is best known as an interpreter of Shakespeare and other serious dramatic fare, but he turns out to be a perfect fit for Thor's bombastic larger-than-life fantasy. Scenes of literal gods bellowing declarations of rage and honor in cavernous Asgardian halls crackle with real mythic intensity, the sort of thing that only those with a solid background in classical theatrical tradition can really pull off convincingly. As for the actors, Chris Hemsworth is an instant star, finding the humor and heart in the role of a mythic being stuck in a mundane world. Also, it must be said that it's about time for the usual dweeby guy, hot girl movie pairing to get turned the other way around, and Natalie Portman looks like she's having fun in that regard, playing a refreshingly ordinary, dressed-down, plain-Jane astrophysicist who draws the affections of a hero who may as well have jumped off the cover of a trashy romance novel. Tom Hiddleston makes for a great, tormented Loki, and Anthony Hopkins as Odin is... Anthony Hopkins as Odin, and to everyone who pitched a fit about Idris Elba playing Heimdall, every scene he's in may as well be subtitled, That's Why. I won't call it a masterpiece. Supporting characters like the Warriors 3 seem to be biding their time for a sequel while Rene Russo gets almost nothing to do as Thor's mother, but when it works, Thor is the best kind of summer action movie. I'll also say that Marvel is getting much better at weaving the shared universe stuff into the plot. Clark Gregg as S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Coulson owns every scene he's in, and while there is a surprise cameo by another prospective Avengers member, it plays out in a way that'll make fans smile but won't confuse everyone else. Those same fans will want to keep their eyes peeled during scenes in Odin's treasure vault, by the way, and of course for the now-expected post-credits bonus scene, which might constitute the single biggest reveal since Marvel started this whole business. All right, three down, one more to go. Please don't screw this up.
trying to work out in my head exactly why Captain America is such a good movie. And make no mistake, Captain America is a really good movie. In fact, I'm inclined to say it's basically perfect, at least to the degree that it's the most perfect Captain America movie I can conceive anyone having made. It has a really good, tight, no BS screenplay that manages to be sprawling, years-long World War II epic, and also a pretty intimate character piece. It has a spectacular score by the underrated Alan Silvestri. It has, without a doubt, the best hand-to-hand -hand combat scenes of any superhero movie ever. I mean, how refreshing is it to see a costumed crime fighter who can actually move around in his outfit? And the production design is gorgeous. Chris Evans is a revelation, both as an actor and a grown-up action hero. The rest of the cast is putting in some heavy work. It's by far the best movie of director Joe Johnston's career. And Haley Atwell, holy sh**. And if all Captain America had going for it was being a perfectly assembled action movie, that would probably be enough. I mean, now that we've all been suitably reminded just how bad superhero movies can get when the people making them just don't give a damn, I imagine being simply good would have been a suitable result. But Captain America is going above and beyond mere execution, and I think the key is what they chose not to include. Irony. Captain America is a 100% irony-free zone. There isn't a lick of cynicism present in this particular story, nor in the person of its main character. The hero of the title, aka Steve Rogers, is a good guy. That's not just his broad moral affiliation, it's his entire character. Captain America is a good guy. He's polite, he's self-sacrificing, he's brave, he's super patriotic but not in a douchebaggy way, he's nice to the point of shyness around girls, he wants to help everybody. At one point, someone asks him if he wants to join the army to kill Nazis, and he goes, I don't want to kill anyone, I just don't like bullies. And he means it, and the movie takes him completely at face value. In that respect, it's almost like he doesn't have a traditional character arc. He's exactly the same inhumanly decent dude at the beginning as he is at the end, and his arc is more about him finding the outlet for that heroic persona. You almost get the sense that if you pointed out to him that he's kinda corny, he'd respectfully ask that you not refer to a storied American produce like corn in the pejorative sense. Now, there's a real possibility that modern-day audiences who are more accustomed to superheroes who are some variation on reluctant, snarky, or psychotic will have trouble wrapping their heads around a protagonist who's already campaigning for world's greatest human before he has powers and a costume. But I think that's really the only possible way you could have approached a character whose uniform is literally the flag of the country he's supposed to be the ideal citizen of, particularly when his enemy, the Red Skull, is an over-the-moon evil with a capital E bad guy. In fact, the Skull's new origin story now involves being kicked out of the Nazis for being too evil. For the Nazis. In the story, the Skull has started up Hydra, a cult of formerly Nazi-affiliated mad science boosters who are tearing up Europe looking for remnants of all that not-made-up-after-all Viking magic stuff from Thor. Having found a really, really powerful one that comic fans and audiences who stayed to the end of Thor will find really, really familiar, the Skull now threatens the entire world. Incidentally, if anyone is still looking for proof that Marvel Studios' occasionally awkward grand scheme of bringing comic book continuity to the movie world is actually working, you need look no further than Captain America, which never feels the need to grind its story to a halt to explain the whys and hows of ancient Norse god stuff existing in the otherwise real world. Because they already explained it. In four. Anyway, Rogers, a patriotic Brooklyn kid desperate to do his part for the war effort but denied service because of his asthma and poor physical health, is offered the chance to join an experimental program to create chemically enhanced super soldiers. When sabotage renders him as the prototype and only super soldier, the army turns him instead into a costumed USO attraction which he at first despises, but when he comes to understand that the seemingly goofy Captain America persona can serve as an inspirational symbol to his fellow soldiers, he adopts the mantle full-time and becomes the leader of the commando squad dedicated to bringing Hydra down. I'm not gonna BS you folks, I love this movie. I love everything about this movie, from the ballsy, unconventional ending to the way it spreads its story across years like a proper epic instead of mere days or weeks. It's the first genuine no-qualifiers home run for Marvel Studios, it's a great action movie, and I found its totally unironic approach to old-fashioned good guy heroics and the mythic but not entirely unreal idealized version of American patriotism to be disarming and a welcome change of pace. I mean, I'll be right up front about this. When I was a young kid reading Captain America comics in the days when you could only dream of seeing a properly realized superhero movie, this is the Captain America movie I wished someone would make someday. Literally, to the letter, this. And it was worth the wait.
you know, it's funny. You can pretty easily find the stories behind how various comic book creators thought up guys like Batman or Spider-Man or whoever, but for some reason I've never seen a lot of background on how Stan Lee and Jack Kirby originally thought up the Avengers. One version I'd heard was that Marvel's guys were under heavy pressure to deliver a new superhero team book, but the team book they were planning on initially, X-Men, was taking too long, so they decided to toss a bunch of their already published characters together into one book and call them the Avengers. And just shy of half a century later, Marvel is still publishing it. Whether that story is accurate or not, it's easy to see why the series continues to be so popular. Marvel's grand publishing innovation of the Silver Age was to take the concept of a continuity-driven shared universe further than anyone had before, and the Avengers was the center of the whole crazy storm, a team whose rotating membership regularly included humans, mutants, aliens, magic users, and every other facet of the diverse Marvel universe. All roads eventually led back to the Avengers. And now, for the first time ever, that kind of sprawling, genre-defying, bigger-than-life storytelling has been attempted on the big screen. There have been plenty of movies based on or inspired by comic book superheroes, especially recently, and a lot of them have been good. Some of them have even been great. But The Avengers, along with the multiple Marvel Studios franchises that have helped lead into it, represents the first time Hollywood has attempted to take the whole damn comic book experience, the sprawling inter-character continuity, the preposterous costumes, the complete disregard for the idea of genres as rigidly separated entities, and throw it all right up on screen. They said it couldn't be done. They said it shouldn't be done. It's the most insane, big-money, creative-risk undertaking since the Lord of the Rings, and they pulled it off. Joss Whedon, Marvel Studios, the assembled cast, they've actually made the damn thing work. The Avengers is a great film, a soaring blockbuster strictly on its own merits and something like a miracle in terms of what it's taken to get here. All at once, a movie that gets right what most other summer popcorn munchers constantly get wrong and that dares to go all the places where previous superhero epics had either been too timid or too serious to explore. Is it the best superhero movie ever made? Eh, I don't know about that. Need to see it a few more times and these three guys still loom pretty large, but it unquestionably raises the bar for the entire genre genre, the new high watermark against which all other entries will now be judged. Now let's clear one thing up. Despite how vital I think the whole continuity experiment has been in the overall development of this, you ultimately do not need to remember or even have seen the various Marvel movies that led up to this. It might clarify a few things, and it might make some of the character beats and details feel deeper and richer, but pretty much everything you need to know about the Avengers gets quickly reestablished, and believe it or not, it's probably the least complicated story of almost any Marvel movie to date. To wit, a magical object initially featured in Captain America has been stolen from the spy agency S.H.I.E.L.D. by Loki, the bad guy from Thor, who plans to use it to summon an army of interdimensional aliens to conquer the Earth. To stop him, S.H.I.E.L.D. leader Nick Fury gathers Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, Hawkeye, Black Widow, and the Incredible Hulk to pool their unique powers and abilities to save the world. Really, that's it. That's the whole story. Oh, and there's some details about mind control and hidden agendas and who shows up when and why, but basically the Avengers is as straightforward and iconic as these things get. It's a feature-length finale, the payoff to five other movies' worth of build-up, and it's all about delivering as many mythic splash-page come-to-life moments as possible. Hero versus hero, hero versus villain, giant tag-team rumble, rescue missions, big-scale disasters, monster battles, it's got all that and more. But iconography can only get you so far. Yeah, it never stops being incredibly cool that it's guys from five different movies teaming up to do the blasting, but let's face it, you've seen superheroes by now, right? You've seen big cities get destroyed, you've seen giant CGI monsters, you've seen good guys tear through waves of foot soldiers. The reason the Avengers feels like such a vastly superior take on such well-covered material is that underneath all the spectacle and despite the deceptively simple story, the Avengers has an absolutely fantastic screenplay, courtesy writer-director Joss Whedon. Now sure, the fact that Whedon gets this genre and how to take it seriously without losing all the fun better than almost any professional in Hollywood is a nice bonus, but the real reason he's such an inspired choice for this project is that no one handles making fantastical figures relatable and balancing group dynamics better than he does. Yes, it's awesome to see Iron Man fight Thor, but you knew that was going to be awesome. The surprises are all in the script details, like how unexpectedly Captain America's time displacement manifests, what a great buddy team Tony Stark and Bruce Banner turn out to be, how well Thor works as the serious one, or the way an unexpected new dimension reveals and Agent Coulson instantly redeems a big chunk of Iron Man 2's awkward second act. It also has to be noted that this is the first time anyone has ever really gotten the Hulk in live action, in the sense that it's only really sad or scary to be Bruce Banner while being the Hulk looks like a lot of fun. Of all the characters, he's probably the one who'll get the most new fans out of this project. Now, do I have some nitpicks? Sure. Hawkeye looks weirdly underdressed compared to his friends, I wish Colby Smulders as Maria Hill had more to do, and the very beginning of the film feels a bit rushed. I have a feeling there are a lot of deleted scenes and I want to see them all eventually, but these are minor issues compared to what it gets right, and how disastrously it could have all gone wrong. The Avengers is a movie I've waited my entire conscious life to see, and the full emergence of an entirely new genre of filmmaking, and that they got it so right on the first try is mind-boggling. This is the one we've been waiting for.
most audiences, the story of Robert Downey Jr. goes something like this. He was a brilliant actor in movies that people generally didn't go to see, he hit a rough patch, he did some time, got out, and a few years later Marvel said, hey, you should be Iron Man, and now it's all good. But to many film buffs, Downey's rebirth actually began three years earlier when he starred in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, the excellent directing debut of infamous action screenwriter Shane Black. So it's almost kismet that Iron Man's return to solo stardom in the wake of conquering the world as a member of the Avengers once more finds Black in the director's chair. I'll say this up front, I was probably too kind to Iron Man 2. It's still not a bad movie. But both it and its predecessor are, in retrospect, flawed but serviceable endeavors mainly getting by on Downey's star power and the promises they had to make about what was to come. Iron Man 3, then, is a movie with a lot to prove, not only that the Avengers-adjacent Marvel heroes are still going to be interesting on their own, but that Tony Stark in particular is still worth building a whole movie around now that Downey is skirting the edges of Johnny Depp-level overexposure. Good news, then, that Iron Man 3 isn't just a good sequel, but a good movie, far and away the best of its own trilogy and probably the strongest individual Marvel movie after Captain America, and that it even stands up on its own as another distinctly auteur work from Shane Black as a welcome indicator that the forthcoming Marvel films will not be abandoning the strong individualistic quirks that made their initial push such a success in the wake of their Disney assimilation. This is the first time I can remember that a mainstream movie had to be a sequel to two different films, tasked with not only finishing up the loose ends of Tony Stark's development in Iron Man 2, but working out how Iron Man's little corner of existence even works following the world-reshaping events of the Avengers. The story's deft solutions to both problems is, ingeniously, to make that question the central theme of the film. On top of all his other lingering physical and psychological baggage, Stark is now suffering PTSD flashbacks related to his dimension-crossing near-death experience a year ago, and even his team's victory has left him feeling powerfully insecure. Having fought alongside gods, monsters, and super soldiers, he's feeling inadequate as a guy whose abilities are reliant on mechanical suits, so advanced he now doesn't even have to wear them to operate them. Much like the first installment, the bigger story is explicitly grounded in post-9-11 allegory, but whereas part one was all about catharsis, this one is about the uneasiness of living in the aftermath of a catastrophe that changes the world overnight. Characters eerily use New York as a universal shorthand for Loki's thwarted invasion in Avengers, as in, New York changed everything, or nothing's been the same since New York. Subtle. Colonel Rhodes' War Machine armor has been repainted Captain America style and rechristened Iron Patriot as a symbol of reassuring strength. Happy Hogan has become Stark Industries' hyper-paranoid security chief. New CEO Pepper Potts is slapping down any research that might smell of weaponization, and Stark himself has gone superhero survivalist, stocking a literal bunker with dozens of multi-purpose, combat-ready Iron Man armors and alienating himself from his friends and family. In other words, the post-Avengers United States and Iron Man Circle in particular are a perfect position to be thrown into chaos by the arrival of Sir Ben Kingsley as the Mandarin, a terrorist mastermind ostensibly connected to the Al-Qaeda-esque Ten Rings group from the first film, but of otherwise mysterious origins. Seemingly Middle Eastern, but cloaked in Oriental iconography with a flair for viral media, he's Bin Laden, Kim Jong-il, and anarchist hackers all rolled into one, the sum total of Western post-9-11 nightmares made flesh, with superhuman henchmen at his command and the inexplicable ability to carry out suicide bombings without bombs. When one such attack hits too close to home and drives Iron Man to brazenly call the enemy out, he ends up stripped of all his tools, tech, and weapons, except for the intellect that he no longer fully trusts, left on his own to solve the Mandarin mystery which he suspects may tie back to Guy Pierce as the suspiciously reemerged colleague Aldrich Killian, ultimately accomplishing a more satisfying midlife crisis superhero fights back arc in a little over an hour than Dark Knight Rises managed in 165 minutes. Impressively, the mystery stuff holds up surprisingly well given the material. The Mandarin is Iron Man's most iconic classic era nemesis, and there are characters and elements called from the more recent Extremis storyline, but they're arranged in a satisfying original way. There's a big gotcha twist about midway through, which I will not spoil and you shouldn't either, that's at once brilliant, funny, and the most subversive thing to happen in the Marvel movieverse, while the actual mechanics of how the big evil plot works is just about the darkest thing you could probably get away with in a big all-audiences blockbuster, as in, I expect people to get mad about this. It's not a perfect movie, of course, but the flubs are pretty minor. The script leans on the conceit of randomly malfunctioning prototype armors for generating tension a little much, and Rebecca Hall's character falls a few lines short of being anything beyond a plot device. A second act subplot with Stark befriending a troubled kid was, to me, one of the rare instances of that trope actually working really well, but if you're allergic to movie children in all forms, he probably won't change your mind. There's also some nagging loose ends, like a villain who busts out a cool and ultra-useful superpower that later on he seems to forget that he has. Artificial tension or not, though, the action scenes are intense. Shane Black is one of the godfathers of modern action comedy already, but Stark's half-armored and improv weapon fights here are Golden Age, Jackie Chan awesome, and a big mid-air rescue sequence is the kind of spectacle I thought we'd have to wait for a different superhero movie to see. The film takes a bold risk in introducing a wholly different level of sci-fi into the Iron Man proceedings, and the big finale pulls a neat trick of being an involving, character-driven set piece with real stakes, while also simultaneously being the biggest and most shameless toy commercial moment that any Marvel release has yet attempted. 
MVP honors, though, have to go to Gwyneth Paltrow. Though she can't help but be too often placed in the role of Killjoy to Downey's clowning, the series has been actively building Pepper Potts into something bigger than a damsel in distress this whole time, and finally seeing it pay off like gangbusters is a major thrill. Best of all, we finally get some resolution. Yes, obviously Stark will be back for Avengers 2, and they'll likely grab him up for assorted cameos or even another Iron Man movie, but if this was to be the big finish for the franchise, it'd actually be a perfect send-off. Either way, we finally got a great 2013 summer blockbuster, and you should absolutely go out and see it. See you in Okay, okay, you want me to talk about the big twist, right? Well, tough. The movie just came out in the US, so I'm not gonna do it here. I'll probably do something more in-depth about it on Tuesday's Big Picture. But people really should get a chance to watch the movie first. What I will say is, I understand why people expected I would hate it, but I actually thought it was kind of awesome. Is it a big change from the comics? Yeah, it is, but it's a fun and interesting change that makes the movie's storyline more interesting, and I'll take that over fidelity. This is a different animal than, say, the Dark Knight series, where they radically altered stuff to be less bizarre, and in doing so made it a lot less interesting, since in this case, the movie is already a lot more bizarre and out there than the other two Iron Man movies put together, and the gotcha here ends up being one of the more fun ideas the Marvel movies have played with thus far. Okay? Alright, go see the movie. Thor The Dark World is the first time since The Incredible Hulk that I've come out of a Marvel Studios movie really hoping we get a director's cut on DVD. That's not to say that the movie as released isn't good, in fact it's pretty damn good, possibly better overall than its predecessor. What was I on? Or its main predecessor, that is. It's obviously not better than The Avengers. But it does feel like one of those movies that had to sacrifice a bit of nuance, character, and even story in order to benefit the modern requirements of what an action movie is supposed to be paced like. But first, to the story. As it turns out, Thor's stop over on Earth to snatch up Loki and the Tesseract in the Avengers was actually part of a much larger campaign of war fighting and peacemaking he's been waging across the Nine Realms ever since the chaotic events of his debut movie. With the mission now winding down, Thor is feeling torn between his father Odin's desire that he assume the throne and his own desire to return to Earth and reconnect with Jane Foster. Part of that decision gets made for him when Jane winds up possessed by a powerful but poisonous supernatural force called the Aether in the course of her search for anomalies like the one that originally led her to Thor. Unfortunately, the Aether is actually an ancient long-lost superweapon sought after by the the villain Malekith, King of the Dark Elves. So when Thor spirits Jane off to Asgard in the hopes of healing her, it inadvertently leads to a devastating Dark Elf attack that leads the whole kingdom broken and reeling. A grief-stricken Odin wants to respond with full-scale war no matter the cost, but Thor thinks a smaller-scale stealth attack is the answer. When Odin forbids it, Thor undertakes the dangerous risk of breaking his evil brother Loki out of Asgardian jail in order to use his knowledge of secret passages and illusion to complete his risky plan, made all the more risky by Loki's ever-changing, unpredictable behavior. As you can already guess, there's quite a bit of story to cover here, and the film's solution is to go through it really, really really fast. The narrative isn't so much rushed as it is hurried. The big action sequences play out to great satisfaction, and the necessary character and story beats get checked off in the appropriate places. What's missing is, well, the connective tissue, the fat, and said fat, the small scenes and deceptively minor beats that enrich the film without necessarily, well, being necessary, like the flirtatious back and forth in a Bond movie, the singing, eating, hanging out scene in The Hobbit, that sort of thing. That's just not there. There's one sequence in particular that should represent one of the biggest emotional moments of the franchise so far that gets addressed in a mostly wordless montage of drama shots. A visually gorgeous sequence, no doubt, but also the kind of scene you'd want to hear the characters talk about. I think you'll understand when you see it. It's not that what's there isn't good, it's that it would be better with some room to breathe, particularly the idea of Jane and Jamie King's Lady Sif becoming rivals for Thor's affections, a subplot that gets heavily hinted at but doesn't actually go anywhere. Or maybe they're saving it for part three. The added room would also have benefited Loki, since the film is at great pains to remind us that his illusion powers are what really make him so formidable, but the rapid pacing occasionally leaves too little time in between double crosses for us to get comfortable enough to be properly misdirected, instead of always just assuming that Loki is one beat away from the next gotcha. Ironically, the only part of the film that feels slow is the part they could have excised completely, an overlong prologue setting up Malekith and the Dark Elves that doesn't really amount to much in the actual movie, since it's clear Loki is still our interesting bad guy, whereas Malekith is an entertaining but one-note madman who wants to destroy the universe bad guy. Said opening might have been better used recapping the events of Thor and the Avengers, honestly, since anyone who didn't see both of those will be completely lost. But, once that setup is done with and the action, overly hurried as it is, gets underway, it's hard to hold minor flaws against the film. It's just too much fun, especially once Loki re-enters the picture and it becomes a brother-brother-buddy routine. This is the biggest leap yet into the silly, nutty, crazy, cosmic side of the Marvel Universe, and it's hard not to get a contact high from how deliriously in love it is with the Jack Kirby-inspired sci-fi fantasy ancient aliens mashup of its worlds, even if the budget seems to have limited our view of the other realms to forest planet, rock quarry planet, and ice planet from the first one. Or the straight-faced, almost defiant way it presents, say, a civilization with anti-aircraft guns but whose citizens live and dress medieval fantasy style just because. Or the presence of stormtrooper guys with bazookas fighting alongside goblins and rock monsters, or Asgard's air force of flying laser-armed canoes. The first Thor had more than a little DNA from Masters of the Universe, but this sequel is more on the lines of the 80s Flash Gordon, and it's a good look.
I just wish it wasn't in quite so much of a hurry all the time, especially since it comes in well under two hours, which is hardly the norm for fantasy blockbusters these days. Thor The Dark World is a good movie that I suspect might be a few missing scenes and longer takes away from a great one. A great one I hope you get to see at some point. Until then, the one in theaters does the job nicely, which is good because it really does look like you're going to want to see all of these to know what's going on from here on out. Each of the Marvel Cinematic Universe films have set themselves a unique challenge thus far. Does anyone care about Iron Man? Is Thor too weird? Is Captain America too much of a square? Have enough people forgotten that other Hulk movie? Is this crossover going to work? Etc. And that's to say nothing of the much bigger challenge. How long can we keep doing the Pixar dance whereby an insanely profitable arm of the Walt Disney Mega Corporation somehow looks like a bunch of risk-taking revolutionary insurgents? The challenge for Captain America The Winter Soldier is twofold. Will audiences accept a complete change in tone and genre for the Captain America franchise from playful old-fashioned patriotic adventure romp to paranoid conspiracy spy thriller, and more broadly, is there room in the Marvel Universe for a slightly darker, more serious breed of superhero movie? That's not to say that it's all been frivolous up to this point, or that Winter Soldier itself slips over into the gloomy gust territory of the distinguished competition, but compared to Thor's fairy tale melodrama, Iron Man's action comedy snark, and the Avengers basically being a gigantic victory party celebrating its own existence, this second solo outing for Captain America might as well be something out of John Le Carre, a spy thriller where everyone is keeping secrets, everything has a dark undercurrent, and the whole thing seems to be one level of amoral corruption fighting other levels of the same. Well, almost everything. That's the film's quietly brilliant conceit. Drop Captain America into an otherwise semi-realistic espionage setting and watch him work like a reverse virus, a figure of absolute good whose mere presence upsets the machinery of deceit. As the story opens, Cap has been working with Black Widow as part of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s special ops team, but he's increasingly uncomfortable with the way things are going. In the wake of Loki's attack on New York, S.H.I.E.L.D. is building up a fleet of new weaponized telecarriers to deal with threats preemptively and unilaterally, and that's just not how Captain America rolls. Into this mix comes Anthony Mackie as the Falcon, a VA hospital counselor with a set of bionic wings, and the Winter Soldier, a cyborg mercenary of unknown origin reputed to be responsible for 50 years' worth of world-reshaping assassinations and acts of terrorism. And then a huge midpoint plot twist rewrites the entire history of the Marvel Universe up to this point in terms of who we thought the good guys and bad guys were, so no more is going to be said about that. What's surprising is that for how unexpectedly deep the film's investment in Marvel Universe continuity turns out to be, in that a bunch of secondary characters familiar from the comics, previous movies, one-shots, and even Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show up in key roles, Winter Soldier stacks up remarkably well as just an action movie in its own right. If not for The Raid 2, this would be the best action film of the year so far. It's got great fight choreography, excellent editing and scene geography, finds endlessly inventive things to do with what otherwise might have been overly familiar shootouts, car chases, and foot races. It does the best job yet of making the physics of Captain America's shield almost look remotely possible. When I say the film is dark relative to the other Marvel movies, that action is a big part of why. Thus far, this has been a series of films built largely out of monster punches, ray guns, and magic hammers, but Winter Soldier is built almost exclusively around bullets, bombs, and blades, plus a plurality of characters who could actually be put down by a shooting or stabbing in the right circumstance. As for the more serious part, well, in case the story description was too subtle in its use of metaphor, Something bad happened in New York, the government is reacting with preemptive strikes and curtailing civil liberties, and the living embodiment of all that's right in America is unhappy about it. Wow. There's so many things this could be about, right? That's the thing about Captain America in a modern setting, though. Once you take him out of the semi-fanciful World War II era, you can't not get political with a character who's named after a country and wears its flag as his uniform. The cast is terrific. Chris Evans remains one of Marvel's best decisions. The Boy Scout bad girl interplay between him and Scarlett Johansson is inspired. Samuel L. Jackson brings needed gravity to Nick Fury. And Robert Redford gives a great turn as an enigmatic shield haunt show named Alexander Pierce, considering his casting at first seemed mostly like an inside joke for movie buffs. But the Breakout star is Anthony Mackie, who shows up looking like a natural-born action hero, while his wingsuit is easily the most instantly cool piece of movie hardware you've seen since, well, probably since Iron Man. If there's somebody who does get kind of the short shrift, it's the Winter Soldier himself. That's kind of unavoidable, despite being the catalyst for a lot of the plot momentum and the fact of his secret identity being kind of a big deal. The nature of his skill set and use in the bigger villainy at play means he shows up under specific circumstances and then vanishes for big stretches of the story. He ends up being compelling and memorable in his own right once all is said and done, and I imagine this won't be the last time we we see him kicking around these movies, but he does sort of wind up in that Darth Maul, I wish this guy was more of the movie zone. This might actually be the best of the non-Avengers Marvel movies so far. It's definitely the smartest, and it takes the most risks in terms of the emotional paces it's willing to put its characters through, and the way it decides to almost casually flip the table on certain major building blocks of the whole universe up to this point. I dug the hell out of it, and I have a feeling we'll be talking about this one as a major highlight by the end of the year.
you know, at some point this whole thing is going to stop working, right? Nobody can keep this kind of streak alive forever. Nobody has that kind of luck or skill or just plain ability. At some point, just based on simple logic, Marvel Studios will stop being able to put anything from their vast archive of characters they want, even an entire team of C and D-listers that most hardcore fans have never heard of, into a movie and get a big crowd-pleasing hit out of it. Eventually, inevitably, one of these damn things has to come up short and prove that not even Marvel and Disney get to be invincible. It's probably not going to be this one, though. Yes, surprising absolutely no one, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, built in deliberate paradoxical hyperbole as the riskiest sure thing of summer 2014, is pretty damn great. A wildly irreverent action comedy set in a richly textured, fully realized world overflowing with memorable characters and crackling humorous dialogue. The kind of playfully joyous but emotionally satisfying ride that used to define the summer blockbuster before punishing dourness and bloated runtimes were the order of the day. Loosely based on various incarnations of a mostly obscure Marvel series that's been kicking around in various forms on and off since the 70s, the conceit here is building a classic formula space opera of the kind that used to keep pulp sci-fi magazines and paperback bookshelves stuck to the brim out of characters and settings from the publisher's extensive backlog of cosmic arcana. As a result, Guardians is easily the Marvel movie most densely packed with inside jokes and continuity nods, but also among the easiest for non-fans to engage in. Sure, there's plenty of information floating around at the margins that fans will recognize as either having been set up before or set to pay off later, but we're encouraged to actually care about it in this context exactly as much as the main characters do, which is to say, not very much at all. Our hero, or at least the closest thing to it, is Peter Quill, a human abducted by aliens as a child on what was already the worst day of his life, who now lives in a populated region of deep space as a self-styled outlaw called Star-Lord. His attempts to fence an ancient artifact place him into conflict with Ronan the Accuser, a villain who needs said artifact in order to bribe even worse villain Thanos into destroying a planet against which Ronan carries an ancient grudge. Quill is pursued by both Thanos' assassin Gamora for the artifact and by bounty hunters Rocket Raccoon and Groot for a price on his head, but all four of them wind up in prison where they meet Bruiser Drax the Destroyer, who seeks revenge against Ronan and his associates. The five of them agree to team up, escape, sell the artifact, and split the cash until they discover that it contains one of those Infinity Stones that have already proven devastating in prior Marvel movies and resolve to do what they can to keep it out of the hands of evil. Eventually. Also wrapped up in this are cosmic Marvel staples like Yondu, the Ravagers, Nebula, Korath the Pursuer, or the Nova Corps, and the Collector. Yeah, there's a lot of weirdo Marvel obscurism in here for fans to chew on, but amusingly, the more of it piles up, the less the heroes and the movie itself actually seem to care. They're also wrapped up in their own hang-ups and issues that almost every would-be intimidating information dump either gets cut off, summarized, or otherwise backgrounded in favor of keeping the focus on the immediate storyline and the character's alternately endearing and infuriating self-possession. Which isn't to say we're in Robert Altman ensemble navel-gazing mode or anything, although the flippant banter does occasionally owe more than a little debt to MASH. Shared universe or not, Guardians is nestled comfortably in the same thematic region as the Avengers, inasmuch as when you get right down to it, the moral center of both films is basically friendship and teamwork are good things. The nominal variance this time being that various hardships and their uniformly unhappy backstories have turned each of the Guardians into some version of a bitter friendless jerk bag, so it's kind of a heavier lift. But only kind of, since the only thing super heroic about this particular Marvel movie is how bravely it struggles against anything that might get in the way of its jokey, dive bar, karaoke good time. That almost becomes a major major flaw near the climax, where we're suddenly asked to be super invested in the stakes of a massive battle against global existential megathreat after the rest of the movie was going, come on, about stuff like that. But it mostly hangs together thanks to how textured and complete the world feels and how charismatic the cast is, though it's possible that the big finish rushes a reveal that, while it works in the machinery of the narrative, could have used a little more breathing room to sink in. Maybe. Chris Pratt anchors things admirably as Star-Lord, one part Philip J. Fry and one part Sterling Archer, obviously arrested at the moment of his abduction and trying comically hard to embody a grade schooler's idea of a badass space hero. Rocket and Groot are miracles of animation and voice work, it's amazing how much dramatic range they get out of them. Zoe Saldana brings real depth to Gamora, which is tricky given that introverted cool is her main character trait. But the revelation might be Dave Bautista as Drax. It's possible that the one-time WWE superstar might be the most immediately believable, understated movie tough guy Hollywood has seen in a long time, exuding an instantly compelling regular guy but bigger charm despite an elaborate head-to-toe makeup job and an ultra-literal affectation that provides some of the film's best, most surprising laughs and most human moments. I'm not sure that Marvel needed to prove that it could do something completely apart from straightforward superhero adventure in the existential something-to-prove sense, but I'm glad they did, and the challenge has been more than met by writer-director James Gunn, a hard-working veteran of the trauma school in the indie scene, who here establishes himself as a serious player on the blockbuster landscape. I've been rooting for this dude for a long time, and it's great to see him arrive. Guardians of the Galaxy might be irreverent to the point of being slight. If the Avengers was an expertly polished Disneyland fireworks show, this is more like a bunch of friends lighting off bottle rockets over a cooler of beer at the beach. But it works like hell to succeed with its own little gonzo niche of summer entertainment, very much in the spirit of classic action comedy genre romps like Big Trouble in Little China, Buckaroo Banzai, or Ghostbusters, with just enough real heart at the center to make it more than just a distraction. This movie rocks.
short version, tons of fun, doesn't quite feel like the instant classic the first one was, kind of feel like they're saving the important stuff for Civil War, only one mid credit scene, still totally worth seeing. You want anything deeper? Keep watching. <laughs> No matter how much one loved the original Avengers, it'd probably be hyperbole to describe it as the godfather of superhero movies, mostly because nothing is the godfather of anything except the godfather. That having been said, I do feel like it's paradoxically fair to call Age of Ultron the godfather 2 of Avengers movies, inasmuch as it's a sequel that is more complex, nuanced, and overall richer as an experience than its predecessor, and thus should logically feel like a substantially superior movie, but doesn't. The reason, of course, is that you can be the lesser of two films and still be more iconic, i.e. containing more signature scenes and memorable set-piece moments. And just as the overall superior Godfather 2 nonetheless feels the lack of Take the Cannoli, Make Him an Offer, Marlon Brando, the overall superior Age of Ultron feels the lack of puny God, I'm Always Angry, and Tom Hiddleston. This isn't an insurmountable challenge, but with the Marvel Universe having set the sequel bar so high, with the shockingly excellent revisitations of Iron Man 3 and Captain America the Winter Soldier, it's hard for Age of Ultron not to feel like a respectable RBI that should have been a three-run Grand Slam. Maybe that's okay. At this point, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has so many films and divergent series managed so expertly that just being good has to be an acceptable eventuality. Age of Ultron delivers as a good action-adventure movie in general, and a jolly reunion of the main bantering badasses in particular serves up a nice helping of new characters and advances the overarching mega-story of the Cinematic Universe in tantalizing ways. It's not game-changing, genre-redefining landmark like its predecessor, but then what is? In any case, our story picks up mainly in the wake of Winter Soldier and, surprisingly, the still-to-be-concluded second season of Agents of Shield. The Avengers, now led by Captain America with Iron Man's money to spend, have been busy putting down the reborn Hydra and, as the film opens, managed to snatch Loki's mind control scepter back from mad scientist Baron Von Strucker, but not before discovering that he's used the thing to turn a pair of war orphan twins with a grudge against Tony Stark into superhumans Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. After subsequently discovering that the magic mind control gem powering the scepter basically works like a computer, Stark and Banner decide to use it as the basis for Ultron, an artificial intelligence protocol that can operate a team of peacekeeping robots designed to fend off threats too big for superheroes. And since apparently the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a universe where the Terminator movies never got made, they don't realize this is a bad idea until Ultron immediately reveals itself to be an unhinged mechanical psychopath who concludes that the only way to really bring about world peace is to eliminate the Avengers, and then for good measure all other human beings too. With the temporary exception of the twins, because Scarlet Witch's mind manipulation powers are good for making Earth's mightiest heroes lose confidence and turn against each other. Ultron's big fancy innovation as far as the killer robot genre goes is that he's Skynet with an emphasis on the net part, which means the Avengers spend effectively the entire film having to physically jet all over the planet, trying to chase down the actions of a villain who can be everywhere at once, providing there's decent Wi-Fi. It also gives the film an excuse to move past the American centrism of the franchise by staging multiple action sequences in Eastern Europe, Oslo, and more, plus an extended stopover in South Africa for some hint dropping about Black Panther for good measure. By now, it's apparent that Marvel frames the Avengers movies as the franchise equivalent of the All-Star game. It's the individual films where the characters go through life-altering personal journeys and where the big plot details get advanced, while the team-ups are all about reconnecting and trading banter amid a substantial but centralized threat, while the Marvel Universe's big looming cosmic payoff grows in the background. This time around, it almost feels like the film is dropping some sly commentary on itself in that regard, by making Ultron's creation literally the result of Tony Stark trying to get a jump start on the threat of sequel villains to come and failing spectacularly, while the show off new hero Vision owes his birth to yet another character popping back into the story from a truncated sojourn elsewhere, and essentially telling the Avengers, guys, my actions here may not make any sense, but I just looked up the plots to the next couple movies, and trust me, we're really gonna need a Christmas-colored android Superman who talks like Spock. But again, the Avengers movies are basically banter-heavy character pieces where everyone who matters just happens to be a superhero, and it delivers where it counts. These are all great characters whose actors are by now snug and comfortable in their roles, and watching them play off each other seldom gets old. The action sequences, though perhaps a little too numerous and protracted, are great fun, and whichever character is your favorite, you're sure to be satisfied with their showing, especially a big new role for Hawkeye. It also has the good sense to know after 11 Marvel movies and over a decade of superhero blockbusters in general, there's no real need to spend too much time tediously explaining how bizarre powers of people like Scarlet which envision work beyond they just do, okay, and moving on. Ironically, if Age of Ultron has a significant weak point, apart from some very obvious editing for time that sends Thor off on a subplot that was clearly meant to set up his next solo outing but now just feels random and out of place, it's Ultron himself. Oh sure, he's a fun bad guy and James Spader has a lot of fun vacillating between his thin-skinned anger and laconic self-absorption, but he occasionally feels like the right bad guy with the wrong plan. One understands that these are action movies first and they need to deliver big-scale thrills, but given that Ultron has very 
very clearly been conceived as a nasty, cutting, more personal interlude of a bad guy giving the Avengers a hard time en route to the bigger cosmic throwdown waiting in the wings, it feels like a strange choice that his ultimate plan still involves an army of punchable henchmen and a doomsday machine just like the last guy the Avengers fought. Don't get me wrong, the final battle itself is a hell of a thing, an extended disaster sequence built around the heroes trying to evacuate civilians stuck in the crossfire of Ultron's master plan that feels like a deliberate take that to the much commented lack of such considerations in rival features like Man of Steel. But while it's satisfying and I'm always on board for some Man of Steel slap around, it does sort of feel like an opportunity is being missed to see how the Avengers handle a smaller but more direct challenge. As with the rest of the film, I enjoyed it, but I do find myself looking forward to the promise of more substantive conflict in Captain America Civil War. Age of Ultron is a terrifically fun diversion, but it feels like the Avengers are in need of a change of pace by now. That appears to be what's in the cards, but I'm left hoping it's about more than a lineup change. At a certain point, we're going to have to stop calling the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies experiments, both because it's getting silly and because it just feels gross for a multi-billion dollar studio tentpole with a happy meal and an action figure tie-in to be spoken of in terms of experimental filmmaking. And yet, here we are again with Ant-Man, once again facing a Marvel feature being framed as some kind of test for the now ultra-powerful Disney subsidiary whose stubborn refusal to release even one outright failure increasingly renders each new film a question of will this be the one where they show some kind of weakness at long last? And should Ant-Man be yet another Marvel success story? We'll simply reconvene for can Marvel handle a black superhero, can Marvel handle a woman superhero, or more immediately, will audiences accept Marvel heroes fighting each other instead of the bad guys. But for now, Ant-Man, where the question is, can even the most ruthlessly efficient old school producer driven outfit in modern Hollywood build a decent movie out of the wreckage of a collapsed production on the quick, and make the result work as a midsummer blockbuster after their main attraction, Avengers Age of Ultron, already bowed months earlier. originally planned as part of the studio's smaller scale, modestly budgeted Phase 1 trial runs, and seemingly kept around on the to-do list mainly because it had earned the interest of cult icon director Edgar Wright, Ant-Man was thrown into disarray when Wright bailed on the project over creative differences shortly after the shooting had finally commenced. The film now in theaters was completed under comedy specialist Peyton Reed, working from a screenplay punched up by Anchorman writer-director Adam McKay that presumably reconciles Wright and Joe Cornish's original story structure with whatever notes and ideas from Marvel led him to say no thanks. But whatever, speculating about behind-the-scenes drama is for gossip rags, and I don't get paid nearly that well. I'm a film critic. So all I can tell you is whether or not the finished Ant-Man is any good just as it is. And the answer is, yeah, it's actually really damn good. Totally solid, super enjoyable little movie that'll probably land on a lot of summer's best lists and arguably succeeds better overall on its own modest terms than Ultron did at its more grandiose ambitions. So yeah, it's actually getting kind of scary that these guys can't seem to fail at anything. But here we are. Ant-Man is a smaller scale, more intimate, more mischievous brand of superhero movie than even Marvel has offered up in a long while, and you can feel its origins as a kind of looser, lighter cousin to the original Iron Man. The geography is concentrated instead of global, the stakes are personal instead of apocalyptic, and the action is focused on scale of imagination instead of scale of destruction. In many ways, however accidentally its place on the release schedule came about, it feels like the perfect sorbet after a summer of increasingly bloated actioners, including Ultron, which even fans have to admit was starting to groan under its own weight towards the end. Our story? Stop me if you've heard this one. Back in the 60s, Michael Douglas super scientist Hank Pym invented a suit that let him change his size while actually increasing his physical strength, allowing him to thwart Cold War evil as a superhero called Ant-Man, so named because he also invented a way to communicate with ants, because why the hell not? But things went bad between Hank and the rest of the superhero community, and he's since been retired as a recluse until now, basically, because his old associate Darren Cross has seized control of his old company and is developing a new weaponized shrinking suit called the Yellow Jacket that he schemes to sell to Hydra. Hey, they're still around. The only hope to stop this is to pull Ant-Man out of mothballs, but with Pym now unable to use the suit himself, and some understandable, if no less unfair, reasons for refusing to let his daughter Hope, played by Evangeline Lilly, use it in his place, Pym instead conscripts Paul Rudd's Scott Lang, an ex-convict looking for redemption in the eyes of his ex-wife and daughter, to become the new Ant-Man and use the suit as part of a daring heist to relieve Cross of the Yellow Jacket technology. As setups go, it's actually pretty standard, but like the similarly classically structured Iron Man, the plot stays basic to make room for the laughs and the drama. Any more complications as to how Scott and his band of gold-hearted thieves hooked up with the Pyms might not have left sufficient space for the jolly, leisurely paced training sequences wherein Scott learns to use his powers and makes adorable Ant buddies. And while perhaps a more complicated villain scheme might have been nice, it might also have nudged out the genuinely heartfelt parallel father-daughter redemption arcs for the now and former Ant-Man. And sure, they could have filled
build in the expected cracks with even more Marvel continuity drops, though there are already two killer ones in the beginning and midway through Act 2, it's a lot more fun to give those moments over to some rapid-fire comic relief courtesy the great Michael Peña as Scott's ex-cellmate BFF. Even setting aside the supposed backstage chaos, it's genuinely surprising to see a superhero blockbuster so confident about playing things small and leisurely. For a good hour, there's no action outside of the shrinking effects in the training sequences, which not only give the characters room to breathe, but also means that the payoff is that much better when things finally start popping en route to the finale, which unfolds as a riot of increasingly imaginative fights, stunts, and chases in increasingly inventive locations, making hilariously bonkers use of the hero and villain's size-changing powers, culminating in a fist-pumping set piece wherein Ant-Man and Yellowjack stage a Man of Steel-style collateral destruction brawl on a table full of children's toys. There is some stuff that doesn't totally work. On the one hand, this is refreshingly the first Marvel movie since probably the first Avengers to get stronger in Act 3 in the climax instead of peaking in the middle, and said climax is an absolute riot, feeling less like a 21st century superhero epic and more like an early 90s live-action Disney joint that Robin Williams might have headlined back in the day. But as much as younger kids are all but guaranteed to love this business, I wonder if they won't be impatient during the earlier, less frenetic character stuff. More substantially, while Lily breathes a lot of life into hope, there's not really that much to her character so far outside of the recurring demonstration of how much more suited to superheroics than Scott is and how unfair it is that this movie isn't about her in the first place. It's all meant to be a running gag, a protracted meta-joke about Marvel's own inability to launch a female-led franchise, and while it has an awesome payoff, it's an awful lot of lampshade hanging for a problem still waiting around to be solved. On the plus side, I was surprised how much of an actual threatening presence Yellow Jacket becomes once the ball gets rolling. I'm not really sure whether or not Ant-Man will end up being among the more important Marvel movies. There's a lot of backstory hovering at the margins and a set of potentially game-changing teases in the pair of post-credit stingers that suggest these characters could become an integral part of the bigger puzzle, along with an intriguing surprise reveal of a literal whole other world's worth of stories to tell. But then again, there are still unresolved plot threads from the Hulk movie sitting around unanswered after almost a decade, so who knows. For now, Count Ant-Man is one of the studio's stronger individual efforts with easily the strongest emotional center since the first Captain America, and one of summer 2015's most enjoyable smaller scale confection. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens when Marvel makes a bad movie. I don't mean as in, hey, this isn't as good as the first one, or this feels totally at odds with the others and or of lower stakes. I mean an entry that actually outright kind of sucks. And I'm not counting the third season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., even though, yeah, season three of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. does kind of suck overall. I mean, at some point, just by law of averages, one of these things is going to be outright bad. And at that point, I'm curious to know what that means, because my suspicion is the answer is not much, actually. By now, the Marvel machinery works so well that comparisons to Swiss watches aren't even appropriate. The studio's output is more like the water cycle at this point, turning hype into engagement, into narrative, and back into hype so efficiently that it feels fully capable of processing a huge failure and just moving on. If Doctor Strange turns out to be not good in November, whatever new slivers of world-building detail it contributes to the bigger picture will still be poured over in forgiveness-generating detail until Guardians of the Galaxy 2 wins everyone back in May with Spider-Man Homecoming batting cleanup in July. Whatever the subject of superhero fatigue comes up, I continue to maintain that the I'm tired of this, let's take a break, oh hey, a new one, I'm reminded why I liked this in the first place cycle that used to be a years-long process for genre movies and franchises now takes mere months and happened for Marvel in the brief interlude between Age of Ultron and Ant-Man. I bring this up because among the surprises to be found in Captain America's Civil War is just how leisurely and self-assured it feels about its own existence. Despite the sensationalism of its basic setup, friends become enemies, superhero civics debate, the end of the Avengers, the frenetic pace of its narrative in terms of tone and self-regard is the most lived-in feeling blockbuster in recent memory, capable of thrilling and confidently carrying a two or three of the most satisfying set pieces the genre has ever managed to deliver up its sleeve like an emergency mood booster, but secure to an almost zen-like state that A, it has the goods, and B, even if it doesn't quite have the goods it thinks it does, we're not going to turn on the Marvel Universe now. The result is that while it could well be, on balance, the best Marvel movie since The Avengers, and a more fitting thematic follow-up to that feature than its own sequel by a substantial measure, it's also the most deliberately plotted and comfy installment in the whole Marvel mega-franchise, the action movie equivalent of a hit TV show wheeling out the big guns for sweeps week, secure along with the audience and the awareness that there's still plenty of episodes to go before the finale. That should be bizarre, given that the entire plot of the film is about literally blowing the status quo of the MCU's central narrative hub to smithereens, but it makes sense given the degree of investment expected of the audience for all that blowing up to matter. We care because we love these characters and their world, we love these characters and their world because we've gotten to know them over more than a dozen films, and because we love them and their world, we know that there will be a dozen more films to come. So for a change, even though the action is as big as ever, the actual stakes are comparatively small and intimate. The world doesn't need to be ending, and it's pointless to pretend that the universe storyline could finish here. So instead, let's enjoy watching our favorite characters work out some issues, develop some new dimensions, and occasionally set off some fireworks. In fact, without giving too much away, this is the first film in a while where the mystery of what's really driving an escalating series of small personal grievances turns out to be 
a smaller, even more personal grievance. The plot you already know from the ubiquitous trailers. Something goes wrong during a routine Avengers mission that leads to collateral damage and takes the already faded bloom off the rose of having superheroes running around unchecked with enough of the global public that the UN steps in to force Captain America and company to become a regulated outfit. Some of them say yes, others say no. Captain America's no becomes more emphatic when a terrorist strike during the signing of the New Deal is blamed on the Winter Soldier, aka Cap's brainwashed ex-Hydra cyborg assassin best friend Bucky Barnes. And he, after being convinced that Bucky is innocent and something more sinister is afoot, goes rogue to hunt for the real culprit. Complicating matters further, one of the UN signatories killed in the attack was the king of the secretive African nation of Wakanda, whose son has now donned the ceremonial battle armor of the Black Panther in order to hunt down and kill the Winter Soldier himself. The big question mark hovering over the film from the beginning has been whether or not this was the point where the overriding commitment to a shared universe would overwhelm the individual storylines. Sure, it's nice to see the cast hanging around and not have to wonder where all the other heroes went during a solo movie, but are we getting the light version of an Avengers sequel at the expense of a Captain America movie? Luckily, the answer turns out to be, we can have both. This is definitely Captain America Part 3, and more importantly, the direct continuation of the Winter Soldier storyline, but since Captain America lives in Avengers headquarters and all the other Avengers themselves comprise about 99% of his known social circle, it can't really help but also be an Avengers movie. And with that aforementioned leisurely confidence in place, Civil War wisely opts to take some of that well-earned audience goodwill and spend it on fleshing out the character stuff that's been driving these movies from the beginning. So even though they're basically guest stars, Vision and Scarlet Witch get some character development, Falcon and War Machine get to voice their opinions about the way their more prominent allies conduct business, Black Widow gets to be morally complicated on a more than superficial level for a change, hell, Black Panther gets an entire introductory character arc two years in advance of his own movie. Seriously, I'm kind of curious what a Black Panther movie is even going to be about now that a version of the story you've kind of expected them to tell in the first Black Panther movie has already been told in the background of this one. And yes, especially in the second act, it does start to feel like the proper Avengers sequel that Age of Ultron never quite managed to become, if for no other reason that it's as strongly a movie about a team falling apart as the first film was about a team coming together. But once the plot heads into its conclusion and the full scope and purpose of the narrative is laid bare, it becomes increasingly clear that Civil War is fundamentally Captain America's movie above all else, inasmuch as the thematic core is all about the push-pull of doing what you want emotionally versus doing what's right, and the Avenger that embodies that inner conflict more so than anyone else in the franchise is, after all, Steve Rogers. The narrative arc they ran out of that where it's completely understandable that the other characters are more than a little skeptical that Cap is thinking clearly when he decides to basically fight the entire rest of the world in order to protect his friend is legitimately fascinating to watch play out in such surprisingly complex terms, and instead of hogging the spotlight as many had feared he would do, Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man turns out to be a perfectly chosen mirror opposite to the same arc. Sure, he seems to be doing what he thinks is right, but it's also clear that retirement not really working out and no longer having any avenging to fall back on is letting his personal demons consume him all over again, and the dynamics at play that allow the pair to maintain their ideological side, while gradually trading places in terms of attitude and approach, is such a strange but interesting way to construct an emotional narrative, I can't help but admire it. The strength of all that hard-on-sleeve operatic emotionality is why I'm having a hard time settling on whether or not this or Winter Soldier is actually the better movie. It'd be hard to argue that Soldier was more rigidly coherent and polished work in terms of structure, but Civil War is substantially more satisfying from a pure cinema perspective. There are some pretty hard to ignore logical leaps at play, mainly in that the entire scenario hinges on someone being able to both manipulate and predict the exact actions of dozens of individuals and entire national governments without really explaining how someone's able to do that, but the payoff is so strong and hits so hard it's genuinely hard to care. And also, yeah, because it's a Marvel movie and by now we've all been trained to sort of give that sort of thing the benefit of the doubt since three movies from now we'll probably just find out he had a magic rock or something. But yeah, it's a superhero movie, but it's practically structured like the macho melodrama version of a Marx Brothers comedy. The storyline is there, but it's largely incidental to the true purpose of creating scenarios for the characters to figuratively bounce off one another. So, if it'll help remind everyone just how natural it is for people in this universe to trip over themselves for the chance to fight alongside Captain America, and having Ant-Man show up will do that, then you do that. And if it'll add some necessary complexity to Tony Stark's storyline to have him, say, help out an underprivileged teenager, and that gives you an opportunity to introduce Spider-Man to everybody, then you do that too. And if that means you've got two more dynamic, cool characters for the big show-stopping end of Act 2 blowout where everyone vents their long simmering frustrations with one another, and since they're all varying degrees of super-powered godlings, it escalates into one of the most ridiculous yet amazing action sequences ever put to film, you do that too. And yes, it's as awesome and worth the price all on its own as you've heard. Holy shit. But however cool that is, what sticks around and satisfies about Civil War is the emotion-driven character work that the action scenes ultimately exist to facilitate and underline, which is why it's so hard to find fault with the actual plot being kind of superfluous shell game. By the time all the big cards on the table finale has rolled around and we find, even as the mysteries have all been solved, the cause of the superhero Civil War has been identified and the narrative reasons behind all the fighting have ceased to be, the fighting isn't over because the dark secrets, deep-seated character flaws, and furious emotional pain involved have transcended the plot mechanics that brought them to the service in the first place. And sometimes 
sometimes things like that just don't go away because the inciting incident has been averted. When was the last time that was the moral of a serious or grown-up movie, let alone a movie where freaking Ant-Man is a featured player? And what's most impressive of all from a broader cultural standpoint is that while it's a given that the smug set will be all too happy to hand Civil War the backhanded compliment of having accomplished all this in spite of being just another Marvel movie, the fact is the weird, risky, offbeat, atypical stuff that makes the film work is largely only possible because Marvel has created a cultural zeitgeist for the film to inhabit. You simply couldn't have a character-driven movie in this genre with this dense of an emotional narrative if so much work hadn't already been done establishing these characters in their world in the first place. What starts as a geopolitical conflict of high-minded hypotheticals narrows down into an extended family schism among a dozen or so ideological standard bearers, and then compresses all the way down into an intensely personal brawl where it's genuinely, viscerally difficult to root completely for or against either side. That's an impressive feat of storytelling in any genre, and while I'm not 100% convinced that Captain America Civil War is the best film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe has produced, it's far and away the best example of why it was worth constructing in the first place, and why it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Spider-Man Homecoming is finally out, and it's... it's okay. It's just okay. It's fine, solid, somewhat disposable, but in no way malnutritious piece of entertainment with a handful of cool moments, a fun, forward-looking cultural vibe, and a game cast that makes up for a lot of its fairly minor shortcomings. You can see my full review right over here. I wouldn't call it so much a disappointment, since in practical terms, the only surprising things it could have conceivably done is be worse than the last two horrible Spider-Man movies, which it's not, or somehow better than the original Spider-Man movies, which it was never ever gonna be. Mostly it just feels inoffensively unambitious, a movie that never once feels the need to strain or stretch at proving itself a worthwhile endeavor, as though it wasn't keenly aware that it's going to make a billion dollars pretty much just for existing. The most notable thing that it could be said to accomplish is acting as a proof of concept for the Spider-Man franchise integration into the broader Marvel Cinematic Universe, but that was already established a couple of movies ago, so what amounts to further cementing that fact shouldn't really be all that thrilling unless you're a shareholder in the Sony Corporation. And yet, let's face it, while there's nothing wrong with this or any other genre film being seemingly designed just to be watched, momentarily enjoyed, and then immediately forgotten about until the next one comes around, it has become an unusual phenomenon for a comic book movie, certainly one in the MCU, which is built around convincing audiences that they should at least feel obligated to keep track of where a bunch of dopey magic rocks are between films in order to get the full experience. But consider this, what if it were okay for the new Spider-Man movie not to be a big deal because, well, the new Spider-Man movie is not in and of itself a big deal. Now that's not the same thing as saying it isn't important to culturally relevant. As I mentioned before, this is effectively our third week covering it, so yes, it would appear that Homecoming is relevant as all hell. These are big pop touchstones that make up the basis of a shared cultural mythology which, in an age where technology and societal evolution are rendering our old definitions of tribe and nationality increasingly obsolete, it could be said to be forming the connective social tissue of the post-national 21st century. Like it or not, these giant multinational tentpole blockbusters matter as cultural objects potentially more than they have at any other time in our history. But that's talking about cultural presence, which is a different thing altogether from the actual weight and importance of a work itself. Spider-Man Homecoming as a film and a story doesn't really matter all that much, because it's not really trying to. It doesn't only lack much in the way of substance, it actually avoids trying to have substance in the first place. From the ground up, it's a film pitched as a side project, even as it's ostensibly the start of the main project for the title character. The three most important things that generally happen to Peter Parker, getting his powers, whatever happened to Uncle Ben in this timeline, and getting tapped to intern with the Avengers, all either happen off-screen or in a previous adjacent movie. Aunt May finding out that Peter is Spider-Man, usually one of the biggest plot points conceivable in any version of this material gets tossed off in Homecoming as a last-minute gag to send the audience home laughing. It doesn't want to have depth of consequence, it just wants to be a fun diversion. And you know what? That's okay. Not all these things have to be these big, sweeping, grandiose epics. Yes, the Sam Raimi films were, and those were great, but the Amazing films actively tried to copy that and were cheap because of it. Homecoming isn't even all that concerned about the faux complexity world-building of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, even though officially declaring these as the Sony movies you have to see in order to keep up with the Disney movies you actually want to see is the entire reason for it to exist. It's helpful to remember that even though we've blown them up into Hollywood demigodhood this new century, comic book superheroes weren't initially built to be important. Good 
creators were able to make them important over time in fits and starts, but we're still mostly talking about a subgenre that was designed to sell weekly magazines half-filled with advertisements to children for pocket change churned out assembly line style mostly by journeymen making working class salaries. In that respect, Homecoming being a quickie one-off story whose main overriding focus is selling you on how much fun Spider-Man is so you'll want to buy a ticket to more of him is actually much closer to the foundational DNA of the genre than something like Batman v Superman or even Civil War, both of which strain in the direction of being meaningfully deep commentary on the nature of heroism or some other such hyperbolic self-importance. Now that's not to say that superhero movies can't be grand, meaningful works of dramatic art as well. The Doc Knight was, Richard Donner's Superman was, Logan was, hell, I've even argued that The Avengers was, and of course part of the reason why Homecoming feels so insubstantial, as previously mentioned, is that we've already seen Spider-Man movies be substantial as hell, and it turns out they've cast a very long shadow. That's not to say that intentionally aiming for a slight story absolves Homecoming for being a mostly unengaging, almost disposable film, either. Wonder Woman was a mostly formula origin story in the Thor mold that's nonetheless risen to be a cultural landmark by leaning hard into its subject's feminist iconhood at a precise moment where that team needed a bit of a pick-me-up. Doctor Strange didn't exactly break new ground narratively, it really is just Iron Man goes to Hogwarts when you get right down to it, but it did blow a lot of people's minds with genuinely new visuals. Even the intentionally glib and breezy Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 managed to catch audiences completely off guard with surprising emotional and thematic depth this year, though I guess you've got a lot of leeway to do that sort of thing when your setting allows for a surrogate family uses the power of friendship to defeat the cosmic embodiment of patriarchy, colonialism, and toxic male entitlement to be the literal premise of your sequel. In the end, though, the fact remains that while I was, I guess, nominally disappointed and certainly not bowled over by Spider-Man Homecoming, it's a good enough film and I'm not really feeling all that put out about it. In fact, I'm coming around to the idea that letting some of these things be slight and disposable might be overall more healthy for the genre and for the culture at large. Thanks to the smoldering trash fire that still is the DC Extended Universe pre-Wonder Woman, we've seen what kind of disaster can unfold when you try to bludgeon the audience into accepting that a bloated, loud, dumb blockbuster is some kind of actually meaningful artifact, and a few more incidents like that could conceivably be enough to just burn everyone out on the whole concept. Look, as a production experiment, the Marvel Cinematic Universe thing is a historic success. It's been fun to watch Marvel transform the movie business into the comic book business, and it continues to be fun to notice all the continuity connections and character relationships and think back on the crossovers and the dopey magic rocks and how that all fits together. But just because all that stuff ideally helps create the momentary illusion that each new superhero adventure is part of something like the most important thing ever doesn't mean that every single one of them needs to take up near permanent residence in the forefront of your thoughts. That's not to say I don't wish Spider-Man Homecoming had at least had something in the way of actual dramatic heft, or that it won't be significantly less forgivable if the inevitable sequel is also a high-flavor, low-protein nothing burger of a movie, but I do like the idea of Marvel and Marvel fans getting comfortable with the MCU movies that don't demand to be obsessed over for however many months it takes for the next one to come out. And yeah, I guess Ant-Man technically already was like that too, and is a significantly better movie than this one, but that's another show. But nonetheless, I'm kinda glad to see it take shape as a trend. It means more overall variety for the superhero genre, and more free headspace for mainstream film culture to devote to an even greater variety of material. Period. Seriously though, the next one of these should probably be about something. Last week's episode of In Bob We Trust was a more than a little depressing interlude about how difficult it can be to square enjoying undeniably entertaining and often high-quality mass-market pop culture with the equally undeniable knowledge that the entities and systems producing said pop culture are often bad, let's just cut to the shorthand, using the example of the Walt Disney Corporation, an unfathomably massive multinational economic leviathan whose frankly terrifying degree of global influence is occasionally difficult to recognize because their initial and still most successful venture was to effectively become the majority shareholder in the abstract concept of childhood itself, and who are currently in the midst of a year-long celebration of the 10th anniversary of their subsidiary, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, aka Hey World, we now own your extended adolescence as well. I'm always a little bit apprehensive about buzzkill episodes about things lots of people enjoy because, well, the world kinda sucks. Life is hard, and the desire to simply enjoy what tiny slivers of happiness one can rescue from the great 21st century garbage fire is not only understandable, it's extremely reasonable. And as much as I think grappling with the uncomfortable parts of our cultural artifacts is necessary and enriching as an experience, I've never been one of these people who gets off on spoiling things for people. I hate seeing the look on people's faces when they first grasp that some dark or regressive subtext about their favorite movie exists, or learn that some artist, author, or creator whose work meant a lot to them turns out to have been not a great person. Now don't misunderstand, I sincerely believe that losing one's 
delusions about what we're inclined to be uncritical of is beneficial, necessary, and healthy, but I also know that I sincerely miss almost every illusion I've ever had to lose, and I absolutely know that I'll be chasing replacements for those feelings probably until my dying day. In any case, I felt even more like a party pooper than usual in this case because Disney and Marvel are currently central to the enormous pop cultural moment that is the impending release of Black Panther, a film derived from a property most of the world had never even heard of prior to Captain America Civil War that has, without even been released yet, transformed months in advance by the zeitgeist into a full-blown event in popular culture and American black popular culture in particular. The first black-led superhero film of the Marvel era, a black director leading an overwhelmingly black cast of characters through a story set largely in and around a hypothetical ultra-advanced African nation untouched by colonialism for the first big-budget Hollywood blockbuster to embrace the Afro-futurist aesthetic, it's not hard to understand how and why the at first largely audience-driven build-up for the feature has at this point become something like a cross between the first airing of Roots and the release of the original Star Wars. Yes, basically every Marvel movie is expected to open big, but none of the others had this many reports or in as far in advance of church congregations, youth groups, and even whole families block-booking theaters just to make sure they can see it, or throngs of attendees showing up to the premieres in either authentic and or Wakandan-inspired African-style fashions as a statement, or multiple huge social media-driven charitable campaigns raising money for the express purpose of, among other adjacent things, taking disadvantaged youth on field trips to see it. And most superhero movies, period, do not get cover stories in Time Magazine by Jamil Smith, which calls the film a milestone and includes the following passage. In the midst of a regressive cultural and political moment, fueled in part by the white nativist movement, the very existence of Black Panther feels like resistance. Its themes challenge institutional bias, its characters take unsubtle digs at oppressors, and its narrative includes prismatic perspectives on black life and tradition. Move, or you will be moved. Wow. Smith's piece goes on to point out, back when the film was announced in 2014, no one knew that it would be released into the fraught climate of President Trump's America, where a thriving black future seems more difficult to see. And then asks, what does it mean to see this film, a vision of unmitigated black excellence, at a moment when the Commander-in-Chief reportedly in a recent meeting dismissed the 54 nations of Africa as shithole countries? As entertaining as that would be. So, yeah, that would be the buzz I felt a little bit bad about, however indirectly, injecting cynicism into. And also, I didn't want to be taken for being part of the weird backlash that's already started up against the movie. Or rather, against people being hyped up for it. Not simply the expected gang of asshole irony bigots who can't wait to pretend to be outraged that they'd never make a movie called White Panther. Just wait till they found out that there were like five white tigers, but they were three Puerto Ricans, an East Indian, and a black Jewish guy. Race war! But also, there's been some more substantive criticism of the Black Panther hype machine as well that's a little harder to dismiss, in as much as it sounds like stuff that you shouldn't dismiss. Squeezed in among the anticipatory rapture from fans and put on ironic but not really racism from troublemakers are some actual legitimate questions about the unintended consequences of attaching this level of broader socio-cultural meaning to a piece of mass market for-profit entertainment. Like for example, yes, there's no question that the first black-led Marvel movie is a big deal, no it's not the first black-led superhero movie or the first black-directed superhero movie. Meteor Man's in town! <laughs> Slap me around and call me Susan. Oh snap, you look oh. Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate up here. But like it or not, the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies are the biggest and most successful run that the genre has ever had, and as far as global pop culture is concerned, they represent the superhero gold standard right now. So, if nothing else, Black Panther represents the concept of black superheroes getting effectively called up to the major leagues. Huh. If the MCU is the majors, is the DC Extended Universe like the XFL? I'm sure everyone has a lot of questions for me, but... <clears throat> However, significant as that is, it's still a movie. A fictional blockbuster movie for which whatever positive message or presence it might embody is inevitably secondary to its function at moving a new set of Marvel merchandise and keeping the bigger Marvel machine running strong at the box office. Given that, is there something even just a little bit, well, questionable, if not outright gauche, about letting a for-profit corporate product become the centerpiece for a cultural moment? Is there a level of moral and or cognitive dissonance involved in letting what amounts to let's all give the Walt Disney Corporation a projected 160 million or over opening weekend to be presented as one of, if not the, major celebratory events marking Black History Month in 2018, at least as far as the media is concerned. Now, I've seen other very reasonable sounding questions crop up on the same lines as well. Is it less than helpful to turn the concept of Wakanda into a shorthand for cultural pride when it's a fictional utopian fantasy setting, while so little is already taught about actual African history in U.S. education to begin with? What does it say that you can raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to take kids to a movie, but not, say, a culturally relevant museum or monument to a 
real person or event? Is it good in the long term for prominent cultural voices to be co-signing the idea that this character, a licensed intellectual property of a giant multinational corporation, has a kind of authentic black American cultural icon now? Hell, is the entire notion of a culturally relevant blockbuster itself innately antithetical to the revolutionary anti-establishment origins of the civil rights movement itself? Is this not something like Disney and Marvel essentially attempting to create a mass marketable subset of black pride symbology that they can own the rights to and forever be associated with? Make way for the hero in you. Black Panther Vibranium Hero Gear, each sold separately. Be Marvel, be more. In much the same way Coca-Cola affixed itself permanently into the narrative of the peace and free love movements in the early 70s through I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing. Yeah, they didn't just make that up for Mad Men, that shit happened. Remember, Disney is Disney because they play the long game. It's not just about you wanting to see the movie this weekend, it's about your grandchildren wanting to go on the ride 50 years from now. So don't think the prospect of seeing quotes and catchphrases from Black Panther showing up on t-shirts and banners at serious newsworthy protest marches or becoming an evergreen popular theme for school kids February art projects serving as consumer generated free advertising for years into the future hasn't crossed their minds. That kind of thing isn't without precedent either. Speaking of Coca-Cola, you do know one of the main reasons that if you grew up in the United States this is what you think Santa Claus looks like is because Coke decided he did, right? Experience luxury performance that takes the crowd. Presenting the all new Lexus LS 500. Long live the king. Those are all interesting and challenging questions, and I'm sure they'll have equally compelling answers. They just won't be answers coming from me, because I don't think I've got any business trying to tell black moviegoers what the correct way to approach a black film that's become something like a cultural touchstone of the moment. It's pretty far outside my jurisdiction in about 12 different ways, at least. But what I can speak on, I think, is the more general idea of any piece of mass market pop culture becoming a political movement symbol, because this has always been a thing that happens and is extremely likely to happen even more frequently now that mass media communication makes the mimetic evolution of these things so immediate and immediate widespread. Case in point, it took well over 30 years of gradual piecemeal appropriation for the swastika to go from an ancient Asian spiritual symbol to the icon of fascism and ultimately Nazism in the Western consciousness. But the same basic thing happened to Pepe the Frog in about two. The fact is, the entire reason popular culture, that is to say the mass cultivation of a shared pool of collective cultural touchstones that can serve as a universal reference point or rhetorical shorthand within a society, is a thing in the first place is because it expedites and strengthens connections between individuals in terms of how they relate to one another. We seldom have time to learn one another's life stories as a way to find common ground, so the mutual recognition of certain widely known stories, songs, movies, works of art, sayings, poems, etc. can act as a shortcut to a sense of ease and familiarity, one that can even transcend more substantive cultural boundaries up to an including language. My name is Krishim. I am new. I don't understand. Wookie? Campbell's new Star Wars soups. Made for yes, the situational irony of illustrating that point through a commercial designed to make you associate heartwarming vibes with the purchase of Campbell's soup and or Star Wars products is quite intentional. As was making this point in the title through a Star Trek The Next Generation reference. Dermak and Jalad at Tanagra. Dermak and Jalad on the ocean calculated to make the subset of my fans who got it feel satisfaction of personal pride and the sense of deeper connection to the series that's also good for my brand loyalty. I hope I didn't say that out loud just now. To stick with the Disney angle for a moment, one of the best known modern examples of this phenomenon in the West was Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, a novelty song popularized through use in the 1933 Walt Disney cartoon version of The Three Little Pigs, being adopted by the popular culture of the time as a resilience anthem about the Great Depression. You can see the present day version of this phenomenon most visibly on social media, where daily news items and major events are responded to and joked about through memes and images from popular culture under the often correct assumption that a clip from a movie or still of a specific character can communicate an idea to a wider audience faster than 280 characters and or some emojis can. The president is having a public Twitter meltdown, here's Kylo Ren being angry at technology to help you express that you think he's being a big whiny baby. A prominent woman did or said something you found inspiring? Game of Thrones has you covered. Don't think the marketing for a new superhero movie looks particularly good? Despondent Affleck will do your morning for you. Feel a little like expressing patriotic sentiment, but don't want to play with iconography that's been tainted through long-term co-opting by assholes? Marvel and Disney have a guy for that. Boy, did it turn out they had a guy for that. Black Panther itself has already spawned dozens of such visual signifiers, including I am inspired by this call to action, I or the person I am responding to am extremely confident, and expression of familiarity and unity, and you'd best believe that such things will find their way into the political shorthand because they always inevitably do. The two are linked inextricably. Bill Clinton throttled Bush the first in 1992 in part because he spoke the language of pop culture better. Ronald Reagan borrowed one of his most successful slogans from one of the Dirty Harry movies. Go ahead, make my day. <laughs> 
I mean, not one of the better Dirty Harry movies, but you know, he did get reelected. On the flip side, Supergirl named its season two finale after a reference to Senator Elizabeth Warren's headline making firebrand speech before Congress, the absolutely massive Women's March of 2018 enthusiastically adopted the iconography of the late Carrie Fisher as Princess Leia as an unofficial mascot figure, and someone is already selling this hoodie. But does having consumer product, intellectual property, and brands at the visual media forefront of ostensibly revolutionary causes, well, dilute the revolutionary part? After all, even if you're not necessarily buying your bandana and signage from a Disney store, don't think they haven't thought about that, one way or another, even just the extra attention eventually translates back into profit and capital for whoever makes and or owns the rights to all this stuff and more broadly continues to feed the establishment machinery overall, doesn't it? That's all really complicated stuff, no question. So where do I come down on it? I think everyone has to make their own decisions when it comes to what you support and how that support manifests overall. But when it comes to things like this, I think it all has to be about where the organizing begins and ends and the nature of organic uses of pop culture as tools of activism versus the co-opting of activism by pop culture manufacturers. There's a currently popular saying on left-wing social media that goes, there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. Now, most seem to take this as a condemnation of even attempting to enjoy consumer entertainment comforts in a socially responsible way, which is a valid, if depressing, Reading, but I also happen to think it could be more validly taken in the spirit of not letting guilt about consuming the wrong way overcome you because there isn't a not wrong way to do it in the first place. If one can't in fact make consuming good, then perhaps one can concentrate instead on how you remain good while acting, living, and existing within an innately flawed, unjust, not good system. When you know nothing matters, the universe is yours. And I've never met a universe that was into it. Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's gonna die. Come watch TV! You know, smart people get a chance to climb on top, take reality for a ride, but it'll never stop trying to throw you, and eventually it will. There's no other way off. And one way to live that just might be to always make sure that you're the one setting the terms. Okay, using Star Wars symbols to make a point about social justice may mean that, to perhaps a negligible degree, your protest march is also serving as free promotion for a big Disney movie, but that only undermines your overriding point if you let it, and doesn't mean you don't get to then tell Pepsi that they can fuck off when they try to sell you Kendall Jenner as a protest icon. And when it comes to Black Panther, from where I sit, most of the movement aspect has played out in the organic fashion. Remember, Disney didn't need this to turn into something like an unofficial February holiday in order to turn a profit with it. It's a Marvel movie. It was going to make a shit ton of money no matter what. The embrace of the film as a political flashpoint, leaning into things like the Black Panther challenge or the what Black Panther means to me hashtag, was not generated initially by studio marketing, but by fans who'd been hoping for the character to get a movie since even before he joined the cinematic universe officially and audiences who were instantly fascinated by their first glimpse of Chala and Wakanda in Civil War. And to the degree that I'm at all comfortable with having an opinion on this matter, period, to me, that's what would make the Black Panther cultural moment at least conceptually a net positive, even if it's also a blockbuster event movie from an ominous multinational with a bunch of toys to sell. Experience awe-inspiring performance in the 2018 Lexus LC500. We all live imperfect lives in an imperfect world, and you don't always get to choose where the things that inspire you come from or who's going to benefit from the exchange of currency and capital that accompanies pretty much everything. But you can, when possible, choose what it is you're inspired to do, what you do with that inspiration, and whether you let it be redirected or co-opted. And if what that means to you at this particular moment is to go out to the theater and get swept up in the potentially inspirational vibe of a big Hollywood movie, even if you have misgivings about it being a big Hollywood movie, well, good for you. Are you finished? <laughs> oh okay all right all right that's that's pretty goddamn hilarious but uh no for for real though what what actually won really wow that's uh that's just awful <laughs> The Academy Awards have come and gone, meaning my obligation to give a damn about them will be over for another 11 to 10 months. Lucky me. In any case, the big story of the year in my circle, since, you know, I do this for a living, was the historic achievement of Marvel's Black Panther, itself already a landmark film for genre representation and an unprecedented success for a predominantly black production, having become the first superhero movie to have been nominated for Best Picture, and while it may ultimately have not taken the prize, 
perhaps dependent on the unique ranked choice ballot the Academy uses for Best Picture voting, wherein being a widely liked movie that isn't most people's top pick but nobody really despises is often ultimately preferable to being a divisive film that some voters love and put at number one but others might be inclined to rank last. After all, while the film itself was widely praised, many older traditional Academy voters had long expressed skepticism that superhero films or indeed any sci-fi movie belongs in contention at all, while still others balked at rewarding the perceived monopolistic behavior of the Walt Disney Corporation. Either way, at this point, I'm less interested in talking about who would, should, will, won't, did, didn't, whatever, win than I am about the bigger conversations surrounding the film's presence. In this case, the predictable backlash against it, i.e. whether or not this specific film deserved what will now forever be the historic distinction of being the first film in its genre to even have been nominated. Some of which can be dismissed out of hand. Sure, you are always going to have a certain level of fanboy angst over it not being a more traditionally established character or franchise like Batman or Superman, one of the major Avengers, or the notion that it should be something that elevates the genre in the vein of a Watchmen or a Dark Knight Returns type adaptation, which I'd argue this kind of does, but we'll get to that, or that this or that other big comic movie from the same year should have been considered instead of, or at least also, which, well, I mean, I definitely posit that Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which was easily the best animated movie of the year, probably the best Spider-Man movie ever, and a very likely fresh contender for the whole genre deserved to be there, definitely, but it's very difficult for animated features to get into the Best Picture category now that there's a separate category for them, but the rest of the year's superhero movies? Really? Because that pretty much leaves Venom, a film where I'm pretty certain at least half of the appreciation is of the ironic variety, and Aquaman, which, okay, look, folks, I liked Aquaman a whole lot, but let's be real about this, at least 60% of the whole Aquaman is actually good thing was coming from a very Andy Kaufman Elvis impersonation kind of place, but by accident, i.e. after almost a decade of every DC movie being different flavors of just god-awful, or an actual full decade, if we're being brutally honest with ourselves and admitting that The Dark Knight Rises was actually kind of lousy outside of Michael Caine and Gary Oldman still being good and getting to see Scarecrow again, you know, except for the first two acts of Wonder Woman, the kind of good one that actually connected with people is the way too big, way too expensive, Flash Gordon-looking mermaid barbarian nonsense about the character popular culture has been using as a punchline for half a century, and the absurdity of that fact is kind of freaking hilarious. Up is down, cold is hot, dogs are cats, Trump is president, and the biggest DC movie is f***ing Aquaman. Who says the apocalypse doesn't have a sense of humor? I mean, if that thing is a Best Picture nominee, Alita Battle Angel might as well run for Prime Minister of Canada. So that leaves Black Panther's own direct follow-up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe timeline, Avengers Infinity War, which, okay, that's at least worth exploring a bit. If you're going to nominate one of the Marvel movies for Best Picture, why not the bigger of the two from the same year? The one that has galaxy-sized stakes, more characters, a more complicated storyline, bigger set pieces, and that crazy ending where half the universe turned into dust. Is that not the bigger, more important to the continuity, and thus better Marvel movie? Okay, yeah, I know this isn't actually a difficult question to parse, but there really are people who sincerely think like this, so look, this is what we're doing this week, okay? Anyway, to some uh, fans, the rationale is both simple to figure out and deeply unfair. It's all about posturing and political pandering. Black Panther, according to such folks, is really just another Marvel movie adhering to the established MCU formula, but it got a lot of extra media attention for having an overwhelmingly black cast, touching on themes of racism and pan-African colonialism, and thus meant something more to a certain segment of the audience, and so the Academy, like the movie press, is overrating and giving it kudos it doesn't deserve in order to score woke social justice points from, uh, well, whichever imaginary lizard people conspiracy administration people whose minds work this way believe keeps track of and hands out said points. So, okay, that's excessively stupid, but if you take it out of the answer pool, where does it leave you? After all, the two films are a little bit similar. They occupy the same genre, they're both part of the same universe, feature a bunch of the same characters, and they're both driven by a confrontation between previously established heroes and a charismatic villain who wants to do a very bad thing for sort of understandable or at least able to be empathized with reason. So, what's the difference? Well, execution for the most part, and I'm not mostly or even mainly talking about Black Panther being a better directed movie, though I think it is overall. It's better paced, more lush cinematography, better hand-to-hand -hand fight choreography, more dynamic editing and shot composition and its exterior location shooting does a generally better job of looking like we're really in a magical hidden African kingdom or Hong Kong or wherever, as opposed to, you know, interchangeable parts of rural Georgia. Though yes, Infinity War on balance has better CGI and a few more elaborate scenes like the Brawl on Titan or the big Space Forge sequence, and it is a good movie as well. What I'm talking about is more specifically thematic execution. Or phrased another way, Black Panther being the superhero movie that finally broke through with Oscar voters isn't really about whatever politics it has, so much as that it has them at all. Again, consider that both films turn on the machinations of villains who believe their actions actually make them the heroes. In Infinity War, Josh Brolin's Thanos believes that resource scarcity will cause universal social collapse, and he's trying to build a doomsday weapon that will let him kill half of all life in order to make that not happen. The Avengers and Guardians, aligned to stop him, recognize that however logical this might be from Thanos' perspective, 
it's the logic of a lunatic space monster who needs to be stopped because evil is evil and good is good. Its secondary plot and story concerns center on magic rocks, where to get them, who's worthy of using them, extremely general questions of self-sacrifice, and not really much else. Which is fine, because the Avengers team-ups aren't so much about advancing the meta plot or developing character so much as they are about getting everyone together for a big wacky party celebrating all the plot advancement and character development that went on in the solo movies. By contrast, Black Panther's version of a similar villain-instigated narrative is that Michael B. Jordan's Eric Killmonger believes that Wakanda's policy of isolationism has made them both directly and indirectly complicit in the ongoing systemic racial oppression of black people elsewhere in the world, including in more direct terms the impoverished and fatherless childhood that helped twist him into what he is now, and he seeks to usurp the nation's throne and seize control of its high-tech weaponry in order to use it to instigate a global race war. With secondary story concerns centering on multiple other characters debating the actual nuances of these same issues within real-world historical context of colonialism, the African diaspora, and even United States imperial military policy. In effect, Black Panther, while yes, still featuring plenty of big action scenes where characters battle one another using flashy costumes and high-tech weapons, is the rare sci-fi fantasy blockbuster that engages in world-building wish fulfillment what-if scenario, in this case imagining an Afrofuturist alternate history of a black African nation that was allowed to thrive and evolve on its own without the interference of white colonialism or the slave trade, with the intent of calling wait a minute on the fantasy in question, presenting an idealized vision of Wakanda that essentially understands the appeal, and in this case at least historically sympathetic logic, of what more or less boils down to a fantasy protectionist ethnostate, but then actually explores the concept and comes away concluding that Killmonger kinda had a point, even as his methods were wrong and ultimately goal was off base. As such, the film takes the form, however optimistic it is about the eventual future, of an epic tragedy. The Black Panther himself is changed by his conflict with Killmonger to the point where his long-held beliefs about his own place in the world, the traditions of his country, and the values of his own ancestors are profoundly shaken to the point where he ends up agreeing, at least in general, with the perspective of the supposed villain, that Wakanda had been doing it wrong all this time, that the world needs to be engaged, isolationism is bad, walls don't work when it comes to geopolitics, etc. Even as Killmonger himself, an even more tragic figure, is unable to extricate himself from the lifetime of pain and history of racial violence that corrupted his soul and hardened his heart, choosing to exit with a line that cements him as the MCU, if not the entire superhero genre to this point's most compelling antagonist ever. Just bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from the ships, because they knew death was better than bondage. And that right there would be the difference between a damn good comic book movie and a damn good comic book movie that also deserves to be called one of the straight up best films of the year. In lieu of jumping on the bandwagon with the rest of the entertainment press and opening every single Captain Marvel review with a full paragraph prologue staking out a position in the thoroughly idiotic culture war that the third least useful human beings on the planet have insisted that we fight over a f***ing Marvel movie, I'm going to use my time to chuckle softly to myself in acknowledgement of the actual god-tier trolling that Annette Benning's top-secret character identity turned out to be. <laughs> A certain stripe of critic likes to complain that the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies adhere rigidly to formula, but to be honest, I think they're reacting more to how similar the reviews end up being than how similar the films are. The differences are in the details, but the qualities by now are pretty consistent. Most of the MCU features are solid B-plus programmers that may rise or fall in one's personal estimation based on a particular like or dislike for an actor, concept, subgenre, theme, etc., with a handful of grade-A standouts like the first Avengers, the Guardians movies, the Captain America sequels, Thor, Ragnarok, and so forth. But yeah, if someone says it's your basic Marvel origin movie and one of the good ones, you know what they mean, so hum along if you know the words. Captain Marvel is a fun, comfy, mid-tier action blockbuster built around an agreeable performance by an overqualified supporting cast and a compelling lead actor you wouldn't necessarily expect to be blowing stuff up with laser fists, but that's why it's cool, gets a little long in Act 2, really good when it's an easygoing, dialogue-driven character piece and sci-fi inflicted morality play, not as good when it's doing world-building housekeeping for interchangeable plot widgets that even the other movies don't pretend actually matter anymore. Odin's treasures. Fake. Unless the stuff in here is fake. The bad guys aren't as interesting as the good guys, but that's pretty much okay because these things aren't really about the villains or even the story. They're about building up the characters as relatable, likable, three-dimensional personalities, so we'll watch them in future sequels and crossovers, which is a cynical marketing strategy that also paradoxically keeps turning these things into weirdly intimate character pieces that make you ignore the less good parts and then really like the good parts, which is basically what happens here. So yeah, it's a Marvel movie, this time around, boasting the nominal gimmick of being mega-franchise's first theatrical prequel since the original Captain America and the 
the first headlined by a female hero. Its other big novelty is to play around at being a kind of non-linear version of an origin story, starting out in what we eventually learned to be the mid-1990s with Brie Larson already boasting mysterious energy-blasting superpowers, near-total amnesia, and serving as a soldier of the alien Kree Empire in their war against the shape-shifting Skrulls. Captured during a failed mission, a mind probe by the Skrulls that turns out to be, for some reason, interested in the same unanswered questions about her past that she is, sends the heroine and a small squad of Skrulls hurtling down toward primitive Earth, where she runs into younger versions of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents Nick Fury and Coulson, and realizes that Earth may actually be her home planet and the key to the past life she can't remember. There's a bit more to it than that, mostly laid out over the course of a second act road trip that the woman who eventually learns her name is Carol undertakes with Fury to stop the Skrulls from getting what they want to get, all having to do with why she can't remember who she is, what she was doing that caused her to wind up in outer space with no memory and superpowers, what the Skrulls are or are not up to, and some less interesting than people will insist it is prequel housekeeping about why and how this all connects back to the later Avengers movies, backdoor origins for a pair of Guardians of the Galaxy bad guys, that kind of thing. The unfolding character stuff is very interesting, has a slow burn, almost Sundance movie from a couple years ago kind of vibe that fits Larson's overall groove very well. The back and forth with Jackson is great, the de-aging effect is really impressive most of the time too, he's super funny in this and it's fun watching him slip back into his slick 90s action comedy guy mode. The whole interlude with Lashana Lynch as Carol's best friend Maria is very affecting and honestly could have used more screen time to develop further. And treading lightly because spoilers, there's a good stretch of Act 3 after a major revelation has turned the way a whole mess of characters relate to one another completely on its head that effectively means that a movie that starts out like Star Wars and then morphs into a kind of Riot Girl Flight of the Navigator turns into Star Trek The Next Generation once it heads back out into space. That's all the stuff that works like gangbusters, see also Ben Mendelsohn as the nominal main scroll baddie Talos and Jude Law as Carol's Cree commander Yon Rog. The stuff that works less well is the world building and continuity business, and also some of the pacing. There's a pair of big action scenes at the end, the context of which is difficult to discuss in depth without giving away the entire third act, that are both quite excellent in isolation and as technical achievements and stunt work and effects, but are both undercut by an element of, you know, I get why fighting these specific people is important, but if they'd had one or two more scenes to establish it, I'd feel it a bit more. And yeah, if you were wondering, do they manage to get around the Senator Palpatine prequel problem of waiting for Carol to be shocked that the blue guys are bad when we've already seen the blue guys be bad in other movies? No, but can you really get around that? I feel like that just comes with being a prequel to something. That's generally why Marvel hasn't done that this much, I assume. Some of the supporting cast does also end up feeling underutilized, particularly Gemma Chan as Minerva, though let's be honest about this, a movie called 120 Uninterrupted Minutes of Gemma Chan would probably still do well to have a bit more footage of Gemma Chan. But when Captain Marvel is working, it's working, and that's overwhelmingly most of the time, and without giving anything away, it admirably commits to both a very decisive inversion of a long-lived Marvel Comics mythology trope and, after a suitable amount of shouting and exploding, commits to a decisive decidedly different sort of finale than blockbusters like this usually go for that I'm not sure completely works, but I admire anyway considering how easy it would have been to do something more conventionally satisfying. Bottom line, I had a really good time with this, and as is usually the case with the better ones of these, I liked it more the more I thought about it after, that's always a plus. With apologies to the folks who I know are hoping for one reason or another that the whole Marvel thing is going to slow down at some point. Now, it looks like this is another 2-3 to three sequels and a handful of team-ups that are in the cards. 7 out of 10, see you next time. Okay kids, ground rules. This is a 98% spoiler free review, so for those of you who give a shit about such things, that means I'm not going to talk about surprises, cameos, specific plot twists, whether or not anyone important dies, whether anyone who died last time comes back somehow because it's a comic book movie and those things can happen, no big moments, nothing that hasn't been dropped in the trailers, and even not all of that because I'm trying to be careful because I'm a nice guy sometimes. But even still, I can't really do a review without at least a bare description of the plot of the thing, i.e. this is the basic setup, what the main characters are attempting to accomplish, so if you consider that to be a spoiler in itself and would prefer to just know the review score up front, okay, fair enough. I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. If you need some sort of comparable metric for measuring that, the first Avengers would be a 9, Infinity War would be about a 7, Age of Ultron would be like a 5, these are the MCU movies I'd say are actually kind of bad, these are the ones I'd be strongly inclined to call 10 out of 10s, my favorite Captain America was the first one, the best Thor and the best Iron Man are both the third ones, and the Incredible Hulk is underrated. We good? Okay then. And here we are at the ending that's not really an ending to a story that's not really a story when you get right down to it. As people are no doubt sick of me pointing out by now, what quickly became clear about what we now call the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that it works because it's structured to feel like a grand overarching omni-narrative if you're into that kind of thing, but it's really a set of individual movies and franchises that sometimes reference and bounce off each other and once every few years coalesce into a bigger cross hour that retroactively pretend to like various events were building to something specific. That's how you kind of had to know Infinity War was getting close to the end. After several films build up to the confrontation with looming big bad Thanos, it turned out there needed to be a whole movie of its own 
just to get around to telling us where he came from and what his goals were, because they hadn't done so in the previous movies, because they didn't know yet, because if you do try to plan out something like that in advance, you might end up with Batman v Superman, Suicide Squad, and Justice League, and nobody wants that. In any case, with that film sorted and the mother of all are you serious cliffhanger climaxes still fresh in audiences' minds, Endgame picks up after rather briefly but cleverly establishing that no, it will not in fact be as easy as tracking down the bad guy, finishing him off, and hitting reset, with an audacious skip forward just long enough for the surviving main characters to have undergone some interesting life, appearance, and personality shifts before introducing what is ultimately the film's main conceit, the chance discovery of a limited ability to leap backwards in time to prior events in recent history, i.e. previous Marvel movies, and perform certain tasks which, if successful, may allow the Avengers to, if not reverse the events of Infinity War, at least return one half of the universe Thanos genocided out of existence with his magic glove. In other words, about roughly one-third of the climax to the biggest serialized blockbuster undertaking pretty much ever is a clip show, or maybe more accurately the action movie equivalent of paging through the family photo albums before you go off to college, and given the circumstances, I have to admire how upfront they are about that aspect. Endgame might not be the most meta of the Marvel features, but it's definitely the most meta about the sentimentality that's come to underline the Avengers installments in particular. Almost everyone's story is so centered on family, surrogate family, longing therefore, lack thereof, etc., as soon as it becomes crystal clear that the second act is mostly going to be long stretches of various Avengers pairings, popping into key moments from their greatest hits catalog so the fans in the audience can laugh and cheer and be wistful about how far they've come, along with the characters, it's hard not to get into the spirit of the whole ha, remember that part, or ooh, look who it is game, assuming you do in fact recognize some or any of it. Because if there is one thing that sets Endgame apart from its predecessor and the other two Avengers movies, and really the whole rest of the MCU period, it's that it really is the first one that does feel more tailored, specifically for the devoted fans, than for a casual, sure, I've seen a couple of these on TV here and there, general audience. Whereas I'd argue even Infinity War can be easily watched as a big, wacky superhero epic with a bizarre ending outside the context of the other Marvel movies. For the most part, it feels like the main reason Endgame's runtime swelled to a full three hours is that one of those total hours could consist entirely of, for lack of a better word, fan service. Fortunately, for the most part, it's the good, mostly unobtrusive, we're all having a good time kind of fan service. Catchphrases are said, callbacks are called back to, references are referenced, beloved supporting characters are returned, old subplots are revisited, loose threads are tied up, things long left unsaid are said, new combinations and pairings and quip tradings are tried out, powers are tested against one another, closures are closed, that kind of thing. All in a lead up for a big climactic battle. Oh, fight me! It is not a spoiler to say that an Avengers movie has a battle near the end of it. What do you think they were going to do? Take Thanos to litigation? But yeah, there's a big battle that's also wall to wall, this one's for the fans' business, and it goes on and on, doing one big cool thing after the other, about one third of which is stuff you've always wanted to see us do, stuff you needed to see us do one more time, and a surprisingly large final third that feels like a series of test runs also sprinkled liberally throughout the rest of the film for the prospective future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe itself, i.e. new team arrangements, pair-offs, and new-to-newer arrival characters getting big, splashy showcase moments clearly designed to generate an entire year of spontaneous social media polling data about who and what should get its own movie next. How does it fare aside from the cultural event business, though, as is the case from the very best of the Marvel films, among which it definitely earns a place eventually? Apart from being an exceedingly fun action feature, it mainly works as a highly agreeable character piece. By now, most of the main featured players have been inhabiting these roles for close to a decade, and it's fun to see them both swing for the fences in classic mode and try on new, world-weary, deeply traumatized takes. True, it doesn't quite measure up to the elevated heights of Guardians of the Galaxy franchise's expertly honed sad clown, sarcastic whimsy, or Black Panther's legitimately transcendent topical gravitas, but there's a boldness to the way that the film attempts, I think, mostly succeeds in making a wish fulfillment fantasy about being able to unwind the end of the world really be about the fact that everyone still has to deal with having lived through it. On the acting front, it's the original Avengers crew who get the most to work with this time out, fittingly, since it's supposed to be the final showcase for the bulk of them, though it would be spoiling to say who gets the biggest moments and why. Apart from that, the MVP surprisingly ends up being Karen Gillan as Nebula, who ends up centered more than you'd expect for plot reasons and carries a lot of important, difficult scenes. I'll be extremely curious to see how certain fans, either devoted or casual, respond to the way certain character stories conclude as the eventual wind-down and features a few endings that are more definitive than others and the implications of which seem to raise more questions than it answers. All told, while in spots a bit shaggy and eventually not a wholly transformative experience, I can safely say Avengers Endgame is at once satisfying and comfortable, yet bizarre and utterly unique entry in what's turned out to be one of the most unique mass entertainment properties of its age. A fitting send-off and a fine preview of things to come, I'm going to give this one an 8 out of 10. Okay, so this is one of those movies where the studio has gone super hardcore about not just casually dropping spoilers for what may or may not be going on in the plot, which is always kind of suspicious to me. 
when it's a movie that's an adaptation of existing stories because a really easy way to stifle any discussion of whether or not the movie works or good is to make out that you're spoiling the fun if you actually discuss any of it. Whereas remember how like in Captain America the Winter Soldier they didn't even try to hide who the Winter Soldier was going to be in the ads even though it's a surprise in the plot of the film because they knew they had a good movie so it wasn't that big a deal and if you just googled the name Winter Soldier it was going to tell you. But then again there are a bunch of super cool surprising things in Spider-Man Far From Home that I wouldn't dream of spoiling, but there's also one kind of important thing in there that's really hard to review the actual movie meaningfully without getting into that I personally feel is kind of a gray area because it's a this movie spoiler, but it's not really a Spider-Man spoiler, you know, but I also, people are kind of hardcore about this stuff sometimes, so I'm just gonna do a little warning now, okay, and we'll do the meaty stuff on the other side of it, all right? Okay, so short spoiler-free version. I really like this one. For reference, I'm that guy who thought Homecoming was kind of a snore, so it's a lot better than that one. Obviously better than the two Andrew Garfield movies, because everything is. No, it's not better than the first two Sam Raimi movies, and as of now, I'm still of the mind that Into the Spider-Verse is the best Spider-Man movie ever made. But this one, recommended, worth seeing. Two post credit scenes both of which are actually really important this time, but I like this one, I recommend it, we good, good. So Mysterio is a bad guy! Yeah, I know, huh? The super well-known, fan-favorite Spider-Man villain, probably one of the five or six most recognizable Spider-Man villains by name and appearance, whose entire gimmick is faking stuff and tricking people so he can do crimes, is in his debut Marvel Cinematic Universe incarnation a villain tricking people so he can do crimes, even though he's initially presented as a cool new superhero showing up to help everyone out now that a bunch of Avengers are dead and or retired. But the thing is, I don't bring that up in the sense of some fanboy snobbery of, oh well, I might have enjoyed it if I didn't know what was going on ahead of time because I've read the comics. But to illustrate by confirmation that I knew Far From Home was working for me and most of the ways Homecoming did not when I realized that I was invested enough in the plot that I'd forgotten to remember that I knew Mysterio's whole deal going in. Like, suspension of disbelief is one thing, suspension of knowledge is on a whole other level. Anyway, the story this time picks up after the events of Avengers Endgame and mainly concerns Peter Parker's attempts to work out new realities of his life now that he and half of the universe are back from the dead five years later but the same age, thanks to the Thanos incident and now living in a world where his friendly neighborhood Spider-Man is now one of the de facto top superheroes working, to the extent that it's clear that a lot of people expect him to be something like the new Iron Man. So yes, we're still doing the overly cute Disney-Sony character sharing meta-narrative thing again, and once again it's laid on a little thick. But at least wait does this mean I'm the top guy here now gives Tom Holland more actual character beats to play with than all of these Spidey needs to prove he deserves to be in the MCU gags from Homecoming, which I got sick of very, very quickly. In any case, as concerns the actual plot, Peter finds his school science club summer trip across Europe covertly hijacked by a Nick Fury operation, battling what's purported to be an invasion from another dimension by rampaging elemental monsters with the aid of Jake Gyllenhaal's Mysterio, who claims to be a displaced superhero from the same alternate reality and thinks Spidey can be of help bringing things under control. You know, because the whole surrogate father figure thing always works out so great for Peter Parker. And yes, it's essentially the entertaining Washington DC interlude from the first movie blown up to feature length, which is a pretty good place to start as sequels go and clearly shows that while this franchise still isn't quite up to par with the rest of the MCU for scope and drama and still can't touch either of the original Spider-Man films or the recent animated Game Changer in terms of visualizing Spider-Man action, with the exception of two Barora fight scenes involving Mysterio's illusions, director John Watt's aesthetic is still mostly like an expensive Disney channel sitcom in terms of staging and texture and cinematic framing, it does know where its strengths are, the characters, and those work great. Holland and Zendaya have genuinely terrific chemistry once again, Jacob Batalon and Angori Rice both get more screen time and develop as real characters as Ned and Betty Brandt, Tony Revolori's Flash Thompson is still a delightful scumbag with real pathos, and uh, Remy He as a new bad guy Brad has a lot of presence, which is good because it feels really transparent that they're setting him up to be something important later. And I also like, as far as the superhero stuff goes, that even though he gets a fair amount of screen and story time, Gyllenhaal's Mysterio isn't ultimately the most important part of it. He's at the center of things, obviously, with the eventual circumstances behind who he is and what's actually going on, reorient what we think the film is about in such a way as to make it more intense, but also smaller and more directly about Peter's personal development. I was initially disappointed because it seemed like the whole playing it being a hero angle was building as some kind of self-aware riff on Marvel's own self-promotion machine, and that seemed like it might be funny, but that's not exactly 
exactly what they do, but like instead, they're continuing to lean hard on the idea that these guys are really dangerous people even when they're not in their costumes and gimmicks. Like, I didn't love everything about Homecoming, but that whole business when Michael Keaton turned around and just pulled a gun on him in the car was about one of the best Spider-Man scenes that's been in any of the movies, period. And there's stuff in this that gets at some of that same energy. Bottom line, I wouldn't call this the perfect or best superhero movie I saw this year, but Far From Home is a bunch of fun, and if you need a metric for that, again, remember, I'm the guy who didn't really like Homecoming. So, 7 out of 10 for this one. Oh, and uh, that first post credit scene, that certainly invites a lot of possibilities I'd previously considered entirely unlikely. You'll see.